Chapter 74. Tessa. I can't keep the ridiculous grin off of my face as Kimberly and Christian show me my new office. The walls are a clean white, the trim and door are dark gray, and the desk and bookcases are black, sleek, and modern. The size of the room is the same as my first office, but the view here is incredible, breathtaking, really. The New Vance Publishing Office is located in the center of downtown Seattle. The city below is thriving, constantly moving, constantly developing, and here I am, right in the center of it all. This is amazing, thank you so much. I say, with probably more enthusiasm than most people would consider to be professional. Everything you need is within walking distance, coffee, any cuisine you could possibly crave, it's all here. Christian proudly stares down at the city and wraps his arm around his fiancée's waist. Stop bragging, would you? Kimberly teases, and he plants. A soft kiss to her forehead. Well, we'll leave you be. Now, get to work, Christian playfully scolds me. Kimberly grabs him by his tie and practically drags him out of the office. I arrange the things in my desk the way I like them and read a little, but by lunchtime I've sent at least 10 pictures of my office to Landon and to Hardin. I knew that Hardin wouldn't respond, but I couldn't help myself. I wanted him to see the view, maybe it would make him change his mind about moving here? I'm only making excuses for my momentary lapse in judgment in sending him the pictures. But I miss him, there, I said it. I miss him terribly, and I was hoping for a response from him, even a simple text. Something. But nothing came. Landon sent an excited response to each of the pictures, even when I sent a cheesy one of me holding a coffee mug with Vance Publishing printed on the side. The more I dwell on my impulsive decision to send those pictures to Hardin, the more I regret it. What if he takes them the wrong way? He does have a tendency to do that. He may see them as a reminder of the fact that I'm moving on, he may even think that I'm trying to rub this whole thing in his face. That truly wasn't my intention, and I can only hope that he doesn't take it that way. Maybe I should send another message to explain myself, I think. Or tell him that I sent the pictures accidentally. I don't know which would be more believable. Neither, I'm sure. I'm overthinking this, after all, they're only pictures. And I can't be fully responsible for how he chooses to interpret them. I can't be fully responsible for his emotions like that. When I walk into the break room on my floor, I find Trevor sitting at one of the square tables with a tablet in front of him. Welcome to Seattle, he says, his blue eyes beaming bright. Hey. I return his enthusiasm with a smile and swipe my debit card through the slot on the massive vending machine. I press a few small numbered buttons and am rewarded with a sleeve of peanut butter crackers. I'm too nervous to be hungry and I'll go out for lunch tomorrow after I've had a chance to explore the area. How do you like Seattle so far? Trevor asks. I look to him for permission, and when he nods, I slide into the chair across from him. I haven't seen much yet. I only arrived yesterday, but I love this new building. Two women enter the room and smile at Trevor, one of them turns to smile at me, and I give her a small wave. They begin to talk with each other, and then the shorter woman, who has black hair, pulls open the refrigerator and takes out a microwavable meal, while her friend picks at her fingernails. You should explore, then. There are so many things to do here. It's a beautiful city, Trevor declares as I munch absentmindedly on a cracker. The Space Needle, the Pacific Science Center, art museums, you name it. I do want to see the Space Needle and Pike Place Market, I say. But I'm beginning to feel uneasy because every time I glance over at the women, I can tell that they're both looking at me and talking quietly. I'm quite paranoid today. You should. Have you decided where you're staying yet? He asks, swiping his index finger across the screen to close the window on his tablet, giving me his full attention. I'm actually at Kimberly and Christian's house for right now only for a week or two until I can find my own place. The urgency in my voice is embarrassing. I hate that I have to stay with them, because Hardin ruined my chance to rent the only apartment I could find. I want to live on my own and not worry about being a burden to anyone. I could ask around and see if there are any vacancies in my building, Trevor offers. 
he adjusts his tie and smooths the silver fabric down before running his hands over the lapels of his suit. Thanks, but I'm not sure your building would be in my price range, I softly remind him. He's the head of finance, and I'm an intern, a decently paid intern, but I'm sure that I can't even afford to rent the dumpster behind his building. He flushes. Okay, he says, realizing the massive difference between our incomes. I can still ask around and see if anyone knows of any places. Thank you. I smile a convincing smile. I'm sure Seattle will feel more like home once I actually have a home. I agree. It's going to take some time, but I know you'll love it here. His crooked grin is warm and welcoming. Do you have any plans after work? I ask before I can stop myself. I do, he says, his soft voice fumbling. But I can cancel them. No, no. It's fine, I was just thinking that since you know the city, you could show me around, but if you already have plans, don't worry about it. I hope that I can make some friends here in Seattle. I'd love to show you around. I was just going jogging, that's all. Jogging? My nose crinkles. What for? For fun. That doesn't sound like much fun. I laugh, and he shakes his head in amused displeasure. I usually go every day after work. I'm still getting to know the city too, and it's a good way to learn the layout. You should come along one day. I don't know the idea doesn't sound appealing. We could walk instead. He chuckles. I live in Ballard. It's a pretty cool neighborhood. I've heard of Ballard, actually, I say, remembering browsing through page after page on sites showing the neighborhoods of Seattle. Okay, yeah. Let's walk around Ballard, then. I close my hands in front of me and rest them on my lap. I can't help but think how Hardin would feel about this. He despises Trevor, and he's already having a hard enough time with our space arrangement. Not that he said this, but I'd like to think that he is. Regardless of how much space is put between Hardin and me, literal or metaphorical, I only see Trevor as a friend. The last thing on my mind is being romantic with someone, especially anyone other than Hardin. Okay, then. He smiles, clearly surprised that I've agreed to come along. My lunch hour is over, so I have to get back to my office, but I'll text you my address, or we can go straight from work if you want. Let's just go straight from here, I'm wearing reasonable shoes. I point down to my flats, mentally patting myself on the back for not wearing heels today. Sounds good. I'll meet you at your office at 5, he says and stands up. Yes, that's fine. I get up too, and toss the crackers wrapper into the trash can. We all know why she got the job anyway, I hear one of the women say behind me. When, out of curiosity, I look over to where they're sitting, they both quickly get quiet and stare down at the table. I can't help but feel that they were talking about me. So much for making friends in Seattle. All those two do is gossip, ignore them, Trevor says, placing his hand between my shoulder blades and guiding me out of the break room. When I get back to my office, I reach into my desk drawer and pull out my cell phone. Two missed calls, both from Hardin. Should I call him back right now? He called twice, so maybe something is wrong. I should, I think, by way of bargaining with myself. He answers on the first ring and hurriedly says, why didn't you answer when I called you? Is something wrong? I stand up from my chair in a slight panic. No. Nothing's wrong, he breathes. I can picture the exact way his pink lips move as he says the simple words, why did you send those pictures? I look around my office, worried about upsetting him. I was just excited about my office, and I wanted you to see it. I hope you didn't think I was trying to be mean about it and brag. I'm sorry for no, I was just confused, he coolly interjects, then goes silent. After a few seconds, I say, I won't send any more, I shouldn't even have sent those. I lean my forehead against the office window and stare down at the streets of the city. Don't worry, it's fine how is it there? Do you like the place? Hardin's voice is somber, and I want to smooth away the frown, that I know, is marring his face right now. It's lovely here. He calls me out. I knew he would, you didn't answer the question. I like it here, I say softly. You sound absolutely ecstatic. I really do like it, 
I'm just adjusting. That's all. What's happening back there? I ask in order to keep the conversation going. I'm not ready to get off the phone with him just yet. Nothing, he quickly responds. Is this awkward for you? I know you said you didn't want to talk on the phone, but you called me, so I was just, no, it's not awkward, he interrupts. It's never awkward with us, and I only meant I don't think we should talk for hours every day, if we aren't going to be together, because that doesn't make any sense, and it's only going to torture me. So you do want to talk to me, then? I ask because I'm pathetic, and I need to hear him say the words. Yes, of course I do. A car horn honks in the background, and I think he must be driving. So what, then? We're going to chat on the phone, like friends, he asks, no anger in his voice at all, only curiosity. I don't know, maybe we could try that? This separation feels so different from the last. This time we separated on good terms, and it wasn't a clean break. I'm not ready to decide if a clean break from Harden is what I actually need, so I push the thought back, file it away, and promise to visit it later. It won't work. I don't want us to ignore one another and not speak again, but I haven't changed my mind about the space thing, I tell him. Fine, tell me about Seattle, then, he finally says into the receiver. Chapter 75. Tessa. After I spend half an afternoon on the phone with Hardin and getting close to no actual work done, my first day at the new office is over and I wait patiently for Trevor just outside my door. Hardin was so calm earlier and he sounded so clear as if he was focused on something. Standing here in the corridor, I can't contain my happiness that we're still communicating. It's so much better now that we're no longer avoiding each other. Deep down, I know that it won't continue to be this easy, talking this way, teasing myself with small doses of Hardin, when in reality I want him, all of him, all the time. I want him here with me, holding me, kissing me, making me laugh. This must be what denial feels like. I'm fine with that for now. It feels pretty good, compared to my other option, sadness. I sigh and rest my head against the wall as I continue to wait. I'm beginning to wish that I hadn't asked Trevor if he was free after work. I'd rather be at Kimberly's house, talking on the phone to Hardin. I wish he had just come here. He could be the one meeting me instead. He could have an office close to mine. He could come by my office multiple times a day, and in between those times, I could make excuses to go to his. I'm sure Christian would give Hardin a job if he wanted one. He's made it clear that he wanted Hardin to work for him again a couple of times. We could spend our lunch hour together, maybe even recreate some of the memories we shared at the old office. I begin picturing Hardin behind me, me bent down over the top of my desk, my hair wrapped tightly around his fist, sorry I'm a little late, my meeting ran over. Trevor interrupts my reverie, and I jump in both surprise and embarrassment. Oh, um, it's okay. I was just, I tuck my hair behind my ear and swallow, waiting. If only he knew what I was thinking, thank goodness he doesn't have a clue. I'm not sure where those thoughts even came from. He inclines his head the other way, peering down the empty hallway. Are you ready to go? Yes. We make small talk as we walk through the building. Nearly everyone has left for the day, leaving the office quiet. Trevor tells me about his brother's new job in Ohio and how he went shopping for a new suit to wear to our coworker Crystal's wedding next month. Idly, I wonder just how many suits Trevor owns. Once we get to our cars, I follow Trevor's BMW as he drives through the crowded city, and we finally arrive in the small neighborhood of Ballard. According to the blogs I was reading before my move, it's one of the hippest neighborhoods in Seattle. Coffee shops, vegan restaurants, and hipster bars line the narrow streets. I pull my car into the parking garage beneath Trevor's building and laugh to myself while remembering that he offered to help me find an apartment in this pricey place. Trevor smiles, gesturing to his suit. I just need to change, obviously. Once we get to his apartment and he wanders off, I nosily glance around his expansive living room. Pictures of family and articles clipped from newspapers and magazines fill the frames on his mantle. An intricate display piece made from melted, 
and molded wine bottles takes up the entire coffee table. Not a trace of dust has been allowed to collect in any of the corners. I'm impressed. Ready. Trevor announces, stepping out of his bedroom and zipping up a red sweatshirt. It always catches me off guard to see him dressed so casually, it's such a vast difference from how he looks normally. After walking two blocks from his building, both of us are shivering and shaking. Are you hungry, Tessa? We can grab something to eat. White puffs of cold air follow his words. I nod eagerly. My stomach growls in hunger, reminding me of just how insufficient a package of peanut butter crackers is for lunch. I tell Trevor to choose a restaurant he likes, and we end up at a small Italian grill only feet away from where we were just walking. The sweet smell of garlic fills my senses, and my mouth waters as we're escorted to a small booth in the back. Chapter 76. Harden. You look much more hygienic now, I tell Richard as he steps out of the bathroom wiping his freshly shaven face with a white towel. I haven't shaved my face in months, he responds, rubbing the smooth skin on his chin. You don't say. I roll my eyes, and he grants me half a smile. Thanks again for letting me stay here his deep voice trails off. It's not permanent, so don't thank me. I'm still not cool with this whole situation. I take another bite of the pizza I ordered for myself and ended up sharing with Richard. I need to find a way to take some of the pressure off of Tessa. She has too much going on lately, and if I can help her in any way, by handling this mess with her father, I will. I know it. I'm surprised you haven't thrown me out yet, he says with a laugh. As if that's something to make a joke about. I stare at him. His eyes look too large for his face, with dark rings showing through his white skin. I sigh. So am I, I admit with annoyance. Richard quivers while I stare at him, not from intimidation, but from a lack of whatever the hell drug it is that he's used to taking. I want to know if you brought any drugs into our apartment while he was staying here just last week. However, if I ask him and he says yes, I'll lose my temper and he'll be out of my apartment within seconds. For Tessa's sake, and for mine, I rise to my feet and leave the living room with my empty plate in hand. The stack of dirty dishes in the sink has managed to double in size, and loading the dishwasher is the last thing I want to do at the moment. Do the dishes as payment. I call to Richard. I hear his deep laughter from the hallway, and he walks into the kitchen just as I reach the bedroom door and close it. I want to call Tessa again just to hear her voice. I want to know about the rest of her day, what does she plan to do after work? Did she stare at her phone with a stupid ass grin on her face, after we hung up earlier, like I did? Probably not. I now know that all my past sins are finally catching up to me, that's why Tessa was given to me. A merciless punishment disguised as a beautiful reward. Having her for months, just to have her taken from me, yet still dangling in front of my face by means of casual phone calls. I don't know how much longer it will be until I succumb to my fate and finally allow myself to break out of this denial. Denial, that's exactly what this is. It doesn't have to be, though. I can change the outcome of all this. I can be who she needs me to be without dragging her down to my hell again. Fuck this, I'm calling her. Her phone rings and rings, yet she doesn't pick up. It's almost six, she should be done with work and back at her place. Where the hell else would she go? While debating whether or not to call Christian, I push my feet into my gym shoes, lazily tie them, and shove my arms through my jacket. I know she'll be upset, beyond mad, surely, if I call him, but I've already called her six times, and she hasn't answered once. I groan and run my fingers over my unwashed hair. This giving each other space shit is really fucking irritating me. I'm going out, I tell my unwanted houseguest. He nods, unable to speak due to the handful of potato chips that he's shoveling into his mouth. At least the sink is free of dishes now. Where the fuck am I even supposed to go? Within minutes, my car is parked in the lot behind a small gym. I don't know what being here will accomplish or if this shit will help me. But right now I'm growing more and more irritated at Tessa, and all I can think about doing is cussing her out or driving to Seattle to find her. I don't need to do either of those things that only make things worse. Chapter 77. Tessa. 
By the time my plate is clear, I'm practically twitching in my seat. The moment we ordered our meals I realized that I left my phone in my car and it's driving me more insane than it should. No one really calls me much. However, I can't help but think that maybe Hardin has, or at least, sent me a text message. I'm trying my best to listen to Trevor while he talks about an article in the Times he read, trying not to think of Hardin and the possibility that he may have called, but I can't help it. I'm distracted during the entire dinner and I'm positive that Trevor notices. He's just too kind to call me out on it. Don't you agree? Trevor's voice pulls me from my thoughts. I scramble through the last few seconds of conversation, trying to remember what he could be talking about. The article was about healthcare, I think. Yeah, I do, I lie. I have no clue if I agree or not, but I do wish the server would hurry and bring our check. As if on cue, the young man places a small booklet on our table, and Trevor hastily pulls out his wallet. I can I begin. But he slides several bills inside, and the server disappears back into the restaurant kitchen. It's on me. I quietly thank him, and glance at the large stone clock hanging just above the door. It's past seven. We've been in the restaurant for over an hour. I let out a breath of relief when Trevor says, well, claps his hands, and stands. On the way back to his place, we pass a small coffee shop, and Trevor raises his brow, a silent invitation. Maybe another night this week? I offer with a smile. Sounds like a plan. The corner of his mouth rises into his famous half-smile, and we continue the trek to his building. With a quick goodbye and a friendly hug, I climb into my car and immediately reach for my phone. I'm frazzled with anxiety and desperation, but I shove those feelings back into the darkness. Nine missed calls, every single one from Hardin. I call him back immediately, only to get his voicemail. The drive from Trevor's apartment to Kimberly's house is long and tedious. The traffic in Seattle is terrible, bumper to bumper and noisy. Honking horns, small cars whipping from lane to lane, it's pretty overwhelming, and by the time I pull into the driveway, I have a massive headache. When I step through the front door, I see Kimberly seated on the white leather couch, a glass of wine in her hand. How was your day? She asks and leans over to place her drink onto the glass table in front of her. Good. But the traffic in the city is unreal, I groan and plop down on the crimson chair next to the window. My head is killing me. Yeah, it is. Have some wine for your headache. She stands up and walks across the living room. Before I can protest, she pours the bubbling white wine into a long stem glass and brings it to me. Taking a little sip, I find it's cool and crisp, sweet on my tongue. Thank you, I say with a smile and take bigger sip. So you were with Trevor, right? Kimberly is so nosy in the sweetest way. Yes, we had a friendly dinner. As friends, I say innocently. Maybe you could try answering again and use the word friend a few more times, she teases, and I can't help but laugh. I'm just trying to make it clear that we're only our friends. Her brown eyes shine with curiosity. Does Hardin know you are being friends with Trevor? No, but I plan on telling him as soon as I speak to him. He doesn't care for Trevor for some reason. She nods. I can't blame him. Trevor could be a model if he wasn't so shy. Have you seen those blue eyes of his? She exaggerates her words by fanning her face with her free hand and we both giggle like schoolgirls. Don't you mean green eyes, love? Christian says as he suddenly appears in the foyer, causing me to nearly drop my glass of wine onto the hardwood floor. Kim smiles at him. Of course I do. But he just shakes his head and gives us both a sly smile. I suppose I could be a model as well, he comments with a wink. For my part, I'm relieved that he isn't upset. Hardin would have flipped the table over if he caught me speaking about Trevor the way Kimberly was. Christian sits down on the couch next to Kimberly, and she climbs into his lap. And how's Hardin doing? You've spoken to him, I assume, he asks. I look away. Yes, a little. He's good. Stubborn, he is. I'm still offended that he hasn't taken me up on my offer, given his situation. Christian smiles into Kim's neck and kisses her softly just beneath her ear. 
these two clearly have no issue with public displays of affection. I try to look away again, but I can't. Wait what offer? I ask, my surprise obvious. Why, the job I offered him I told you about it, didn't I? I wish he'd come out here. I mean, he only has, what, one semester left, and he'll be graduating early, no? What? Why didn't I know about this? This is the first I've heard about Hardin graduating early. But I respond, erm, yeah, I believe so. Christian wraps his arms around Kimberly and rocks her a little. He's practically a genius, that boy. If he had applied himself a little more, his GPA would be a perfect four. He really is very smart I agree. And it's true. Hardin's mind never ceases to surprise and intrigue me. It's one of the things that I love most about him. Quite the writer too, he says and steals a sip of Kimberly's wine. I don't know why he decided to stop. I was looking forward to reading more of his work. Christian sighs while Kimberly undoes the silver tie around his neck. I'm overwhelmed by this information. Hard in writing? I remember him briefly mentioning that he used to dabble a little in it during his freshman year of college, but he never went into detail. Every time I brought it up in conversation, he changed the subject or poo poo the idea, giving me the impression that it wasn't very important to him. Yeah. I finish off my wine and stand, pointing to the bottle. May I? Kimberly nods. Of course, have as much as you please. We have an entire cellar full, she says with a sweet smile. Three glasses of white wine later, my headache has evaporated, and my curiosity has grown geometrically. I wait for Christian to bring up Hardin's writing or the job offer again, but he doesn't. He dives into a full-blown business discussion about how he has been in talks with a media group to expand Vance Publishing's in-house film and television efforts. As interesting as it is, I want to get to my room and try to call Hardin again. When an appropriate opening presents itself, I wish them a both a good night and excuse myself to rush off to my temporary bedroom. Take the bottle with you. Kimberly calls to me just as I pass the table where the half-full wine bottle rests. I nod, thanking her, and do just that. Chapter 78. Hardin. I walk into the apartment, my legs still sore from kicking the hell out of that bag at the gym. Grabbing a water bottle from the fridge, I try to ignore the sleeping man on my couch. It's for her, I remind myself. All for her. I gulp down half of the bottle, dig my phone out of my gym bag, and turn on the power. Just as I try to call her, her name pops up on my screen. Hello? I answer as I pull my sweat-soaked t-shirt over my head and toss it to the floor. Hi is all she says. Her response is short. Too short. I want to talk to her. I need her to want to talk to me. I kick up my shirt, then pick it up, knowing that if she could see me, she'd scowl at me for being such a slob. What are you up to? I went out exploring the city, she answers calmly. I tried to call you back, but it went to your voicemail. The sound of her voice soothes my temper. I went back to that gym. I lie back on the bed, wishing she were here with me, her head on my chest, instead of in Seattle. You did? That's great, she says, then adds, I'm taking my shoes off. Okay, she giggles. I don't know why I told you that. Are you drunk? I sit up using one elbow to hold my weight. I've had some wine, she admits. I should have caught that immediately. With who? Kimberly, and Mr. Vance Christian, I mean. Oh. I don't know how I feel about her going out drinking in a foreign city, but I know it's not the time to bring that up. He says you're an amazing writer, she says, accusation clear in her voice. Fuck. Why would he say that? I reply. My heart pounds. I don't know. Why won't you write anymore? Her voice is full of wine and curiosity. I don't know. But I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about you, and Seattle and why you've been avoiding me. Well, he also said you're graduating next semester, she says, ignoring my words. Christian obviously has no idea how to mind his own damn business. Yeah, so? I didn't know that, Tessa says. I hear her shuffling around, and she groans, clearly irritated. I wasn't hiding it from you, it just didn't come up. 
You have a long time before you graduate, so it doesn't matter anyway. It's not like I was going to go anywhere. Hang on, she says into the phone. What the hell is she doing? How much wine has she drunk? After listening to her mumble incomprehensibly and futz around, I finally ask, what are you doing? What? Oh, my hair was caught in my shirt buttons. Sorry, I was listening, I promise. Why were you grilling your boss about me, anyway? He brought you up. You know, since he offered you a job a couple of times and you refused, you were a topic, she says with emphasis. Old news. I don't exactly remember mentioning the offer, but I wasn't purposely keeping it from her. My intentions concerning Seattle have always been clear. You can say that again, she says, and I can practically see her rolling her eyes again. I changed the subject. You didn't answer when I called you. I called so many times. I know, I left my phone in the car at Trevor's she stops mid-sentence. I stand from the bed and pace across the room. I fucking knew it. He was only showing me around his friends, that's it. She's quick to defend herself. You didn't answer my calls, because you were with fucking Trevor? I growl, my pulse quickening with each beat of the silence, that meets my question. Then she snaps, don't you fight with me over Trevor, he's only a friend, and you're the one who isn't here. You don't choose my friends, do you understand? Tess of I warn. Harden Alan Scott, she exclaims, and bursts into laughter. Why are you laughing? I ask, but I can't help the smile. That takes over my face. Fuck, I'm pathetic. I don't know. The sound of her laughter resonates through my ears and travels straight down to my heart, warming my chest. You should put the wine down, I tease, wishing I could see her roll her eyes in response to my scolding her. Make me, she challenges, her voice thick and playful. If I was there, I would, you can be damned sure of that. What else would you do, if you were here, she asks me. I drop back onto my bed. Is she taking this, where I think she is? I never know with her, especially when she's been drinking. Teresa Lin Young, are you trying to have phone sex with me? I taunt her. Immediately she coughs violently, choking on a gulp of wine, I assume. What? No. I, I was just asking, she squeals. Sure, you can deny it now, I joke, laughing at her horrified tone. Unless is that something you want to do, she whispers. You're serious? The thought alone makes my cock twitch. Maybe I don't know. Are you mad about Trevor? The tone of her voice is much more intoxicating to me than any amount of wine I could consume. Hell yes I'm irritated that she was with him, but that's not what I want to discuss right now. I hear her gulp loudly, followed by the soft clink of a glass. I don't give a shit about fucking Trevor right now, I lie. Then I command, don't chug the wine. I know her too well. You'll get sick. I hear a couple of loud gulps, come through the phone. You can't boss me around long distance. She's chugging the wine again, to build up her nerve, I'm sure. I can boss you around from any distance, baby. I grin, running my fingers over my lips. Can I tell you something, she asks quietly. Please do. I was thinking about you today. And when you came to my office, that first time you were thinking about me fucking you, when you were with him. I ask her, praying she says yes. At the time, I was waiting for him. Tell me more about it, tell me what you were thinking, I press. This is so fucking confusing. Every time I'm talking to her, I feel as if we aren't taking a break, that everything is the same as it's always been. The only difference at the moment, is that I can't physically see her, or touch her, Fuck, I want to touch her, run my tongue across her smooth skin I was thinking about how she starts, but then takes another drink. Don't be embarrassed. I coax her to continue. That I liked it, and it made me want to do it again. With who? I ask, just to hear her say it. You, only you. Good, I say with a smooth grin. You're still mine, even though you're making me give you space. You're still only for me, you know that, don't you? I ask her in the most gentle way I possibly can. I know, she says. My chest swells, and I welcome the flood of relief, that comes along with her words. Are you mine, she asks in a voice filled with much more confidence than it had moments ago. Yes, always. I don't have a choice. 
I haven't since the day I met you, I want to add, but I stay quiet, nervously awaiting her response. Good, Tessa says with authority. Now, tell me what you would do, if you were here, and don't leave out any details. Chapter 79. Tessa. My thoughts are slightly hazy, and my head feels full and heavy, but in the best way. I'm grinning from ear to ear, intoxicated from the wine in Hardin's thick voice. I love this playful side of Hardin, and if he wants to play, I'll play. Oh no, he says with that cool tone of his. Do you tell me what you'd want me to do first? I take a pull straight from the bottle. I already did, I say. Chug some more wine. Do you only seem to tell me what you want when you've been drinking? Fine. I run my index finger along the cool wooden bed frame. I want you to bend me over this bed here and take me the way you did on that desk. Instead of embarrassment, I only feel the warm flush of heat trailing up my neck to my cheeks. Hardin curses under his breath. I know that he didn't actually expect me to answer more graphically. Then, he asks quietly. Well I start, pausing to take another long swig to gain confidence. Hardin and I have never done this before. He sent me a few racy text messages, but this this is different. Just say it, don't be shy now. You would hold me by the hips, the way you always do, and I'd cling to the sheets to try and keep myself stable. Your fingers would dig into me, leaving marks in their wake I clench my thighs together when I hear his breathing hitch through the line. Touch yourself, he says, and I quickly look around the room, momentarily forgetting that no one can hear our private conversation. What? No, I harshly whisper, cupping the phone. Yes. I'm not doing that here. They'll hear me. If I were talking to anyone other than Hardin in this way, I'd be completely horrified, wine or not. No, they won't. Do it. Do you want to, I can tell. How can he? Do I want to? Just lie back on the bed, close your eyes, spread your legs, and I'll tell you what to do, he says smoothly. As silken as his words are, they come through as a full-on command. But I, do it. The authority in his voice, makes me squirm, while my mind and my hormones battle it out. I can't deny, that the idea of Hardin coaxing me through this over the phone, naming the dirty things he would do to me, raises the temperature of the room at least 10 degrees. Okay, now that you've submitted, he begins without my actually having said anything, tell me when you are down to only your panties. Oh but I quietly pat over to the door, and turn the lock between my fingers. Kimberly and Christian's room, as well as Smith's, is on the upper level of the house, but as far as I know, they could still be on the first floor with me. I listen closely for movement, and when I hear a door shut above me, I feel better. I hurry and grab the wine bottle, finishing it off. The heat inside of me has turned from a small flicker to a blazing inferno, and I try not to overthink the fact that I'm stepping out of my pants and climbing onto the bed, wearing only a thin cotton shirt and panties. Still with me? Hardin asks, an evil smirk surely on his face. Yes, I'm I'm preparing. I can't believe I'm really doing this. Stop overthinking it. You'll thank me after. Stop knowing everything that I'm thinking, I tease, hoping that he's right. Do you remember what I showed you, right? I nod, forgetting that he can't see me. I'll take nervous silence as a yes. Good. So, just press your fingers, where you did last time chapter 80. Harden. I hear Tessa gasp, and I know she's followed my instructions. I can picture it perfectly, her lying on the bed, legs spread open. Holy fuck. God, I wish I was there right now, to watch you, I groan, trying to ignore the blood rushing straight to my dick. Do you like that, don't you, to watch me, she gasps through the line. Yeah, fuck yeah, I do. And you like to be watched, I can tell. I do, just like the way you like it, when I pull your hair. Reflexively, my hand goes between my legs. Images of her writhing underneath my tongue, her fingers tugging my hair as she moans my name, fill my mind, and I press my palm against myself. Only Tessa can make me this hard this quickly. Her moans are quiet, too quiet. She needs more encouragement. Faster, Tess, move your fingers in a circle, faster. Imagine I'm there, it's me, and my fingers are circling you, making you feel so fucking good, making you come, I say, 
keeping my voice down in case my annoying house guest happens to be in the hall. Oh my, she pants and moans again. My tongue too, baby, swirling against your skin, my sinful lips pressed against you, sucking, biting, teasing. I slide my gym shorts down and begin to stroke myself gently. I close my eyes and focus on her soft pants, please, and moans. Do what I'm doing, touch yourself, she whispers, and I'm gifted with the image of her back arching off the mattress as she pleasures herself. Already am, I mutter, and she whimpers. Fuck, I want to see her. Talk to me, again, Tessa begs. I fucking love the way her innocence disappears in these moments she always loves to hear such filthy things. I want to fuck you. No, I want to lay you back on the bed and make love to you, hard and fast, so powerfully that you're screaming my name as I thrust deeper and deeper, I'm she moans low in her throat. And her breath catches. Come on, baby, let go. I want to hear you. I stop speaking when I hear her come, soft whimpers and whines as she bites into the pillow or the mattress. I have no fucking clue, but the image sends me over the edge and I spill into my boxers with a strangled groan of her name. Our matched breathing is the only sound on the line for seconds or minutes, I can't keep track. That was she begins, panting and out of breath. I open my eyes and rest my elbows on the desk in front of me. My chest moves up and down as I try to catch my own breath. Yeah. I need a moment. She giggles. A slow smile tugs at the corners of my mouth, and then she adds, and here I thought we had done close to everything. Oh, there are plenty of other things I want to do to you. However, alas, we have to be in the same city to do them. Come here, then, she says quickly. I put the phone on speaker and examine my hand, front and back. You said you didn't want me there. We need space, remember? I know, she says a little sadly. We do need space and this seems to be working for us. Don't you think? No, I lie. But I know she's right, I've been trying to be better for her, and I'm afraid that if she's quick to forgive me again, I'll slip and lose the motivation. If we when we find our way back to each other, I want it to be different for her. I want it to be permanent so I can show her that the pattern, the endless cycle, as she calls it, will end. I do miss you so much, she says. I know she loves me, but each time I'm given a sliver of reassurance, it's like a weight's been lifted from my chest. I miss you too. More than anything. Don't say too. It sounds like you're just agreeing with me, she says sarcastically, and my small smile grows, overtaking my entire being. You can't use my ideas, way to be original, I playfully scold her and she laughs. Can too, she childishly fires back. If you were here, I'd be greeted with her tongue sticking out at me in mock defiance. God, you're feisty tonight. I roll off the bed, I need a shower. That I am. And incredibly daring. Who knew I could convince you to get yourself off over the phone? I chuckle and walk into the hallway. Harden, she squeals in horror like I knew she would. And by the way, you should know by now that you can get me to do just about anything. If only that were true I murmur. If it was, she would be here now. In the hallway, the floor is cold on my bare feet, and I wince. But when I hear a voice start to speak, I drop my phone to the ground. Sorry, man Richard says close to me. It was getting a little warm in here earlier, so I he stops when he sees me scramble to pick up my phone but it's too late. Who is that? I hear Tessa exclaim through the speaker on my phone. The drowsy, relaxed girl she'd been so recently is gone, and she's on high alert. Harden, who is that? She asks more forcefully. Fuck. I mouth a quick way to fucking, go to her father and grab the phone, removing it from speaker and hurrying to the bathroom. It's, I begin. Was that my father? I want to lie to her, but that would be fucking stupid and I'm trying not to be so damn stupid anymore. Yeah, it was, I say, and wait for her to scream into the receiver. Why is he there, she questions. I will are you letting him stay with you? She releases me from the panic of having to find the right words to say in order to explain this fucked up situation. Something like that. I'm confused. So am I, I admit. For how long? And why didn't you tell me? 
I'm sorry it's only been like two days. The next thing I hear is the sound of water running in a tub, so she must be feeling okay to start that up. But still she asks, why did he come there in the first place? I can't bring myself to tell her the whole truth, not right now. He doesn't have anywhere else to go, I guess. I start the shower myself as she sighs. Okay are you mad? I ask. No, I'm not mad. I'm confused she says, her voice full of wonder. I can't believe you're actually allowing him to stay at your apartment. Neither can I. The small bathroom fills with a thick cloud of steam, and I wipe the mirror with my palm. I look like a fucking ghost, a shell, really. Under my eyes, dark rings have already appeared from my lack of sleep. The only thing that gives me life is Tess's voice coming through the line. It means a lot to me, Hardin, she finally says. It does? This is going much, much better than I expected. Yes, of course it does. I feel giddy all of the sudden, like a puppy that's been rewarded with a treat from its owner and surprisingly, I'm perfectly fucking okay with that. Good. I don't know what else to say to her. I feel slightly guilty for not telling her about her father's habits, but this isn't the time, and over the phone isn't the way. Wait so my father was there, when you were you know, she whispers, and a small roar sounds on the other line. She must have turned on the fan in the bathroom, to drown out her voice. Well, he wasn't in the room, I'm not into that type of thing, I tease, to lighten the mood, and she responds with a giggle. You probably are, she jokes. Nope. That's one of the very few things I'm not into, believe it or not, I say with a smile. I will never share you, baby. Not even with your father. I can't help but laugh as she makes a sound of disgust. You're sick. Sure am, I fire back, and she giggles. The wine has made her adventurous and heightened her sense of humor. Me? Well, I have no damn excuse for this ridiculous grin on my face. I need to take a shower. I'm standing here with cum all over me. I step put of my boxers. Me too, she says. Not the part about being covered with you know, but I'm pretty messy and in need of a shower too. Okay so I guess we should get off we did already. She laughs, proud of her terrible attempt at a joke. Ha ha, I tease. But then I rush out my have a good night Tessa. You too, she says, lingering on the line, and I end the call before she can. Hot water cascades down my body. I still haven't fully recovered from her touching herself while we were on the phone. It's not only a huge fucking turn on, it's more than that. It shows that she still trusts me, she still trusts me enough to expose herself to me. Lost in my thoughts, I push the hard bar of soap across my tattooed skin. It's hard to imagine that only two weeks ago, we stood in the shower together I think this one is my favorite. She touched a tattoo and peered up at me through wet lashes. Why is that? I hate that one. I glance down at her small fingers trailing over the large flower etched near my elbow. I don't know. It's sort of beautiful the way you have a flower surrounded by all of this darkness. Her finger moved over the haunting design of a withered skull just below. I never thought of it that way. I pressed my thumb under her chin to bring her eyes to mine. Do you always see the light in me? How's that possible when there isn't any? There's plenty. And you'll see it too. Someday. She smiled and stood on her toes to press her lips against the corner of my mouth. Water rushed between our lips, and she smiled again before pulling away. I hope you're right, I whispered into the stream of water, so quietly that she didn't hear me. The memory haunts me, replaying as I try to wash it away. It's not that I don't want to remember her, because I do. Tessa is my every thought, she always is. It's only the memories in times, when she gave me too much praise, when she tried to convince me that I'm better than I really am, that drive me mad. I wish I could see myself the way she sees me. I wish I could believe her when she says that I'm good for her. But how can that be true, when I'm so fucked up? It means a lot to me, Hardin, she said only minutes ago. Maybe if I keep doing what I'm doing now, and stay away from shit that could get me in trouble, I can continue to do things that mean a lot to her. I can make her happy instead of miserable, and maybe, just maybe, I could see some of the light in myself that she claims to see. Maybe there is hope for us after all. 
Chapter 81. Tessa. I can't help the anxiety that fills me as I drive through the campus. The WCU Seattle campus is not as small as Ken had made it out to be, and all the roads in Seattle seem intent on curving and going up and down hills. I prepared as best I could to ensure that everything would go as planned today. I left two hours early to be sure to make it to my first class on time. Half of that time was spent sitting in traffic, listening to talk radio. I'd never understood that whole fad until this morning, when a distraught woman called in and told the story of her best friend betraying her by sleeping with her husband. And the two of them running off together, taking her cat, Mozzie, with them. Through her tears, she held on to a certain amount of her dignity well, about as much as someone calling into a radio station to relate her own tale of woe possibly could. I found myself sucked right into her dramatic story, and in the end I got the sense that even she knew she was better off without that guy. By the time I stopped by the administration building and retrieved my student identification card and parking pass, I have only 30 minutes before my class. My nerves are stretched to the limit, and I can't shake my anxiety over possibly being late to my first class. Luckily, I find a student parking lot easily, and it's near to where my class is, so I make it with 15 minutes to spare. As I take my seat in the front row, I can't help but feel a sense of loneliness. There was no meeting Landon at the coffee shop before class, and he's not in the seat next to mine now as I sit in this classroom remembering my first half year of college. The classroom fills with students, and I begin to regret my decision when I notice that besides me and one other female, the entire class is guys. I thought I'd sandwich this course, which I didn't really want to take, between some others this semester, but overall I just wish I hadn't decided to take political science at all. A handsome boy with light brown skin sits down in the empty chair next to me, and I try not to stare at him. His white button-up shirt is crisp and perfectly ironed at the seams, and he's wearing a tie. He looks like a politician, bright white smile and all. He notices me looking at him and grins. Can I help you with something, he asks, his voice full of both authority and charm. Yeah, he's certainly going to be a politician one day. No, eh sorry, I stammer, not meeting his eyes. When class starts, I avoid looking at him and instead focus on taking notes, reading over the syllabus repeatedly and looking at my map of the campus until class is dismissed. My next class, art history, is much better. I feel more comfortable surrounded by a casual crowd of art students. A boy with blue hair sits next to me and introduces himself as Michael. As the teacher has us all go around and introduce ourselves, I find that I'm the only English major in the room. But everyone is friendly, and Michael has quite a sense of humor, making jokes throughout class and keeping everyone entertained, including our instructor. Creative writing is last, and most certainly the most enjoyable. I'm lost in the process of writing down my thoughts on paper, and it's freeing, entertaining, and I love it. When my professor releases us, it feels as if only 10 minutes have passed. The rest of my week comes and goes in this fashion. I oscillate between feeling like I'm finding my way around more easily and thinking I'm just as confused as ever. But most of all, I feel as if I'm constantly waiting for something that never comes. By the time Friday evening arrives, I'm exhausted and my entire body is tense. This week has been challenging, both in good ways and bad. I miss the familiarity of the old campus and having Landon there with me. I miss hard in meeting me between classes, and I even miss Zed and the glowing flowers that fill the environmental studies building. Zed. I haven't spoken to him once since he rescued me from Steph and Dan at the party and drove me all the way to my mother's house. He saved me from being thoroughly violated and humiliated, and I haven't even thanked him. I put down my political science textbook and reach for my phone. Hello? Zed's voice sounds so foreign, despite the fact that it's been no more than a week since I've heard it. Zed? Hi, it's Tessa. I chew on the inside of my cheek and wait for his response. Um, hey. I take a deep breath and know that I have to say what I call to say. Listen, I'm so sorry for not calling you to thank you sooner. Everything has happened so fast this week, 
and I think part of me was trying not to think about what happened. And I know that's not a good excuse so, I'm a jerk, and I'm sorry, and, the words are rushing out of my mouth so quickly I can barely process what I'm saying, but he interrupts me before I finish. It's alright, I know you had a lot going on. I still should have called you, especially after what you did for me. I can't tell you how thankful I am that you were at that party, I say, desperate for him to understand how much gratitude I feel toward him. I shiver at the recollection of Dan's fingertips trailing up my thigh. If you hadn't shown up, God only knows what they would have done to me hey, he says to silence me, but gently. I stop them, before anything could happen, Tessa. Try not to think about it. And you definitely don't have to thank me for anything. But I do. And I can't help how much it hurts me that Steph would do what she did. I never did anything to hurt her, or any of you, please don't include me with them, Zed says, clearly a little insulted. No, no, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to say that you were involved. I just meant your group of friends. I apologize for the way my mouth has been moving before my mind has approved the words. Sake, he mumbles. Anyway, we aren't much of a group anymore. Tristan is leaving for New Orleans early, in a few days, actually, and I haven't seen Steph on campus all week. Oh I pause, and look around this room I'm staying in, in this massive, somewhat alien house. Said, I'm also sorry for accusing you of texting me from Hardin's phone. Steph admitted that it was her during the Dan incident. I smile, to try and counteract the shiver, that person's name induces. He lets out a little breath, that might also be a chuckle. I have to admit, I did appear to be the most likely candidate to have done that, he replies sweetly. So how's everything? Seattle is different, I say. You're there? I thought maybe since Hardin was at your mom's house, no, I'm here. I interrupt him, before he can tell me how he too, expected me to stay for Hardin. Have you made any new friends? What do you think? I smile and reach across the bed to grab my half-empty glass of water. You will soon. He laughs, and I join him. I doubt it. I think of the two women who were gossiping in the break room at Vance. Each time I saw them this week, they seemed to be laughing to themselves, and I can't help but think they were laughing at me. I really am sorry it took me so long to call. Tessa, it's okay, stop apologizing. You do that too much. Sorry, I say and lightly smack my palm against my forehead. Both that waiter, Robert, and Zed have said that I apologize too much. Maybe they're right. Do you think you'll come visit anytime soon? Or are we still not able to be friends, he asks softly. We can be friends, I remark. But I have no clue when I'll be able to come visit. Truthfully, I'd been wanting to go back home this weekend. I miss Hardin and the traffic less streets further east. But wait, why did I just call it home? I only lived there six months. And then I realize, Hardin. It's because of Hardin. Wherever he is will always feel like home to me. Well, that's too bad. Maybe I'll make a trip to Seattle soon. I have some friends there, Zed says. Would that be okay, he asks after a few seconds. Oh, yeah. Of course. Okay. He laughs. I'm flying down to Florida to see my parents this weekend, I'm running late for my flight, actually, but maybe I could try next weekend or something. Yeah, sure. Just let me know. Have fun in Florida, I say just before I hang up. I put the phone down on my stack of notes, and mere seconds later it vibrates. Hardin's name appears on the screen, and taking a deep breath and ignoring the flutter in my chest, I answer. What are you doing, he asks immediately. Um, nothing. Where are you? Kim and Christian's house. Where are you? I sarcastically respond. Home, he says matter-of-factly. Where else would I be? I don't know the gym. Hardin has been consistently going to the gym, every day, all week. I just left there. Now I'm home. How was it, Captain Brevity? Same, he curtly remarks. Is something wrong? I ask him. No. I'm fine. How was your day? He's quick to change the subject, and I wonder why, but I don't want to push him, not with a phone call to Zed weighing on my chest already. It was okay. 
long, I guess. I still don't like my political science class, I groan. I told you to drop it already. You can take another class for your social science elective, he reminds me. I lie back on my bed. I know I'll be okay. Are you staying in tonight? He asks, warning clear in his voice. Yeah, I'm already in my pajamas. Good, he says, which makes me roll my eyes. I called said, just a few minutes ago, I blurt. Might as well get it over with. Silence looms on the line, and I wait patiently for Hardin's breathing to slow. You what? He says sharply. I called him to thank him for last weekend. Why, though? I thought we were I can hear him barely controlling his anger as he breathes heavily into the receiver. Tessa, I thought we were working on our problems. We are, but I owed it to him. If he hadn't shown up when he did, I know. Hardin snaps, like he's trying to keep something at bay. I don't want to argue with him, but I can't expect anything to change if I keep things from him. He said he was thinking about visiting, I say. He's not coming there. End of discussion. Hardin Tessa, no. He isn't. I'm doing my best here, okay? I'm trying really fucking hard not to lose my shit right now, so the least you can do is help me out on this. I sigh in defeat. Okay. Spending time with said can possibly end well for anyone, said included. I can't lead him on again. It's not fair to him, and I don't think he and I will ever be able to have a strictly platonic relationship, not in Hardin's eyes, or, really, in Zed's own. Thank you. Now, if it were always that easy to get you to comply what? I will never just comply, Hardin, that's easy, easy, I'm just teasing. No need to get all testy he says quickly. Anything else I should know about while you're at it? No. Good. Now. Tell me what's been happening on that shitty radio station you've become obsessed with. And as I go into detail about a woman who was looking for her long-lost love from high school, while she was pregnant with her neighbor's child, the lurid details of the story, and the scandal that ensues, have me animated and laughing. By the time I mention the cat, Mozzie, I'm laughing hysterically. I tell him how it would be hard to be in love with one man, while pregnant with another man's child, and he doesn't agree. Of course, he believes the man and woman brought the scandal upon themselves and teases me for getting so involved in talk radio. Hardin laughs along with my story, and I close my eyes and pretend that he's lying next to me. Chapter 82. Hardin. I'm sorry. Richard says with a ragged breath. A layer of sweat has coated his entire body as he wipes his vomit from his chin. I lean against the doorframe and debate whether or not to walk away leaving him in his own filth. He's been doing this all day, vomiting, shaking, sweating, whining. It will be out of my system, Sue. He leans back over the toilet and expels more vomit, like a geyser. Fucking great. At least he made it to the toilet this time. Hope so, I say and leave the bathroom. I open the window in the kitchen, allowing the cold breeze to waft in and grab a clean glass from the cabinet. The sink creaks as I turn the faucet to fill the glass, and I shake my head. What the hell am I supposed to do with him? He's detoxing all over my goddamn bathroom. With one last sigh, I take the glass of water and a sleeve of crackers into the bathroom and place them on the rim of the sink. I tap his shoulder. Eat these. He nods in acknowledgement, or from delirium treatments and or withdrawal. His skin is so pale and clammy, it reminds me of clay. I don't actually think eating crackers will help him, but the possibility is there. Thanks, he finally groans, and I leave him alone again to vomit all over my bathroom. This bedroom, my bedroom, isn't the same without her. The bed is never made correctly when I climb into it at night. I've tried time and time again to tuck the corners of the sheet under the mattress the way Tessa does, but it's just not possible. My clothes, clean and dirty, are scattered across the floor, empty water bottles and soda cans clutter the end tables, and it's cold. The heat is on, but the room is just cold. I send her one last text message to wish her good night and close my eyes, praying for a dreamless sleep for once. Tessa? I call from the hallway, announcing that I'm home. The apartment is quiet, only soft sounds fill the air. Is Tessa on the phone with someone? Tessa? I call again 
and turn the bedroom doorknob. The sight that greets my eyes stops me dead in my tracks. Tessa is sprawled out on the white duvet, her blonde hair matted to her forehead with sweat, the fingers of one hand gripping the headboard, and a fistful of raven hair in the other. As she rocks her hips, I can feel ice replacing the hot blood pumping through my veins. Zed's head is buried between her creamy thighs. His hands roam her body. I try to move toward them to grab him by his throat and throw him against the wall, but my feet are frozen to the ground. I try to scream at them, but my mouth refuses to open. Oh, Zed, Tessa moans. I cover my ears with my hands, but it doesn't help, her voice travels straight to my brain, there's no escaping it. You're so beautiful, he coos, and she moans again. One of his hands travels up to her chest, and he runs his fingertips over her, while his mouth is pressed against her. I'm frozen. They don't see me, they haven't even noticed that I'm in the room. Tessa calls out his name once more, and when his head lifts from between her thighs, he finally sees me. He keeps eye contact with me, while his lips run up her body, to her jaw, nipping along the way. My eyes won't leave their naked bodies, and my insides have been ripped from my body and tossed onto the cold floor. I can't bear to watch this, but I'm forced to do so anyway. I love you, he says to her, while smirking at me. I love you too, Tessa whimpers. She rakes her nails down his tattooed back as he thrusts into her. Finally, my voice comes as I scream, silencing their moans. Fuck. I scream out and grab the glass from the nightstand. With a crash, it shatters against the wall. Chapter 83. Harden. I'm pacing back and forth across the floor, furious fingers tugging at my sweat-soaked hair, all the clothes and books I'm stepping on registering vividly on the soles of my bare feet. Harden? Are you okay? Tessa's voice is thick with sleep. I'm so glad she answered. I need her to be here with me, even through a telephone line. I I don't know, I croak into the phone. What's wrong? Are you in bed? I ask her. Yes, it's three in the morning. Where else would I be? What's wrong, Hardin? I just can't sleep, that's all, I admit, staring into the darkness of our, my, room. Oh she lets out a long breath of relief. I was worried for a second. Did you talk to Zed again? I ask her. What? No, I haven't talked to him, since I told you about him wanting to visit. Call him and tell him that he can't. I sound like a lunatic, but I don't give a shit. I'm not calling him this late, what's gotten into you? She's being so defensive, though I suppose I can't blame her. Nothing, Tessa. Never mind. I sigh. Harden, what's going on, she asks, clearly worried. Nothing, just nothing. I hang up the phone and press down on the power button until the screen turns black. Chapter 84 Tessa you're not staying in your pajamas the entire day again, are you? Kimberly asks the next morning when she sees me sitting at the kitchen counter. I spoon a mouthful of granola into my mouth, so I'm unable to answer her. Because that's exactly what I planned to do today. I didn't sleep well after Hardin's phone call. He has since sent a few text messages, none of them mentioning his odd behavior last night. I want to call him but the way he hung up so quickly makes me think better of it. Besides, I haven't paid much attention to Kimberly since I arrived. Most of my free time has been spent talking on the phone with Hardin or doing my first round of assignments for my new classes. The least I can do is chat with her over breakfast. You never wear clothes, Smith chimes in, and I nearly spit the granola out onto the table. Yes, I do I reply, my mouth still full. You're right, Smith, she doesn't. Kimberly cackles, and I roll my eyes at her. At that moment Kristen enters the room and places a kiss against her temple. Smith smiles at his father and soon-to-be stepmother before looking back to me. Pajamas are more comfortable I tell him, and he nods in agreement. His green eyes look down at himself, taking in his Spider-Man print pajamas. Do you like Spider-Man? I ask, wanting to start a conversation that isn't about me. His small fingers pick at his toes. No. No. You're wearing those I reply and point to his clothing. She bought them. He nods toward Kim. Then he whispers, don't tell her I hate them. She'll cry. I laugh. 
Smith is five going on twenty. I won't, I promise him, and we finish the meal in comfortable silence. Chapter 85 Hardin Landon shakes the moisture from his hat onto the floor and rests his closed umbrella against the wall in an exaggerated and theatrical way. He wants me to see what an effort he's making to help me out. Well, what was so urgent that I had to come here in the freezing rain, he asks, half smug, half concerned. Looking at my bare chest, he adds, you know, the thing that I actually put clothes on for and ran over to help out with. So what is it? I wave toward Richard, who's spread out on the couch, asleep. Him. Landon leans to one side to look around me. Who is that, he asks. Then, straightening, he looks at me with a gaping mouth. Wait is that Tess's father? I roll my eyes at his question. No, it's another random, homeless fuck that I let sleep on my couch. It's what all the hipsters are doing nowadays. He ignores my sarcasm. Why is he here? Does Tessa know? Yes, she knows. However, she doesn't know that he's been going through withdrawal for the last five days and vomiting all over the damn place. Richard groans in his sleep, and I grab Landon by the sleeve of his plaid shirt and pull him into the hallway. This is clearly a little out of my stepbrother's league. Withdrawal, he asks. From, like, drugs? Yes. And alcohol. He seems to ponder this for a second. He hasn't found your liquor yet, he asks, then raises a brow at me. Or has he already consumed it? I don't have any liquor here anymore, dick. He peers back around the corner to the sleeping man perched on my couch. I still don't see how I fit into this. You're going to babysit him, I inform him, and he immediately takes a step back. No way. He tries to whisper, but his voice comes out much more like a hushed scream. Chill. I pat his shoulder. It's only for one night. No way. I'm not staying here with him. I don't even know him. Neither do I, I counter. You know him better than I do. He would be your father-in-law someday, if you weren't such an idiot. Landon's words hit me harder than they should. Father-in-law? The title sounds odd, when I repeat it in my mind, while I'm staring at this gross lump of man on my couch. I want to see her, I plead. Who Tess? Yes, Tessa, uh, I correct him. Who else? Landon starts playing with his fingers like a nervous child. Well, why can't she come here? I don't think it's a good idea for me to stay with him. Don't be such a pussy, he's not dangerous or anything, I say. Just make sure he doesn't leave the apartment. There's plenty of food and water here. You sound like you're talking about a dog Landon remarks. I rub my temples in annoyance. Dude might as well be at this point. Are you going to help me or not? He glares at me, and I add, for Tessa? It's a low blow, but I know it will work. After a second he breaks, and nods. One night only, he agrees, and I turn away from him to hide my smile. I don't know how Tessa will react to me ignoring our space agreement, but it's only one night. One short night with her is what I need right now. I need her. Phone calls and text messages are sufficient enough during the week, but after that nightmare I had, I need to see her more than anything. I need to confirm the fact that her body holds no marks that were put on it by anyone other than myself. Does she know you're coming? Landon asks me as he follows me into the bedroom, where I search the floor for a t-shirt to pull over my bare torso. She will once I arrive, won't she? She told me about you two on the phone. She did. That's really unlike her. What would she tell you about us getting off over the phone I wonder? Landon's eyes go wide. Whoa. What? What? I wasn't oh god, he groans. He tries to cover his ears, but it's too late. His cheeks turn a deep red, and my laughter fills the bedroom. You have to be more specific when you're talking about Tessa and me, don't you know that by now? I grin, relishing the memory of her moans coming through the line. Apparently I do. He scowls and regroups. I meant that you two have been talking a lot on the phone. And does she seem happy to you? My smile disappears. Why do you ask? Worry spreads over his features. I'm just wondering. I'm a little worried about her. She doesn't seem as excited and happy about Seattle as I assumed she'd be. I don't know. I rub my hand over the back of my neck. 
She doesn't sound happy, it's true, but I can't tell if it's because I'm an asshole or because she doesn't like Seattle as much as she thought she would I answer truthfully. I hope it's the first. I want her to be happy there Landon says. So do I, sort of I say. Landon kicks a dirty pair of black jeans out from under his foot. Hey, I was going to wear those I snap and bend down to grab them. Don't you have any clean clothes? Not at the moment. Have you done any laundry at all since she left? Yes I lie. Aha. Uh -huh. He points to the stain on my black t-shirt. Mustard, maybe? Shit. I pull the shirt off and toss it back onto the floor. I don't have shit to wear. I pull out the bottom drawer of the dresser and let out a relieved breath when I spot a stack of clean black t-shirts in the back. What about these? Landon points to a pair of dark blue jeans hanging in the closet. No. Why not? You never wear anything other than black jeans. Exactly, I retort. Well, the only pair of pants you seem to have to wear is dirty, so, I have five pairs, I correct him. They just happen to be the same exact style. With a huff, I reach past him into the closet and pull the blue jeans off of the hanger. I hate these fucking things. My mum bought them for me for Christmas and I vow to never wear them, yet here I am. For true love or something. She'd probably swoon. They're a little snug. Landon bites down on his bottom lip to keep from laughing. Fuck off, I say and raise my middle finger, then finish shoving shit into my bag. Twenty minutes later we're back in the living room, Richard is still asleep, Landon is still making obnoxious remarks about my fucking tight jeans, and I'm ready to go see Tessa in Seattle. What should I tell him when he wakes up, he asks. Whatever you want. It would be quite funny, if you fucked with him for a little while. You could pretend you're me, or that you don't know why he's there. I laugh. He would be so confused. Landon doesn't see the humor in my idea, and he basically pushes me out the door. Be careful driving, the roads are slick, he warns. Gotcha. I hoist my bag over my shoulder and leave, before he can make another mushy ass remark. During the drive, I can't help, but think about my nightmare. It was so clear, so fucking vivid. I could hear Tessa moaning that asshole's name. I could even hear her nails running along his skin. I turn the radio up to drown out my thoughts, but it doesn't work. I decide to think of her instead, of memories of us together, to stop the images from haunting me. Otherwise this will be the longest drive of my entire life. Look how cute those babies are. Tessa had squealed, while pointing to a platoon of squirming little beings. Well, only two babies, actually. But still. Yeah, yeah. So cute. I rolled my eyes and dragged her along through the store. They even have matching bows in their hair. She was smiling so big and her voice did that weird high-pitched thing that women do when they're around small children and some hormone or other kicks in. Yep, I said and continued behind her down the narrow aisles at Connor's. She'd been searching for some specific cheese she needed to make our dinner that night. But babies overtook her brain. Admit that they were cute. She beamed up at me, and I shook my head in defiance. Come on, Hardin, you know they were cute. Just say it. They. Were. Cute I responded flatly, and she pressed her mouth into a hard line, while she crossed her arms over her chest like a petulant child herself. Maybe you'll turn out to be one of those people who only thinks their own kids are cute, she said, and I watched as a dawning recognition quickly stole her smile away. That is, if you ever want kids. She added somberly, making me want to kiss away the frown on her beautiful face. Sure, maybe. Too bad I don't want them, though, I said, trying to drill the statement permanently into her head. I know she said softly. Soon thereafter, she found the item she was so avidly searching for and dropped it into the basket with a dull thud. Her smile still hadn't returned by the time we were waiting in the checkout line. I looked down and gently nudged with my elbow. Hey. When she looked up at me, her eyes were dim and she was obviously waiting for me to speak. I know we agreed not to talk about kids anymore I started as she focused her eyes on the floor. Hey, I repeated and set the basket on the floor next to my boot. Look at me. Both of my hands covered her cheeks, and I pressed my forehead against hers. It's okay. 
I wasn't really thinking when I said that, she admitted with a shrug. I watched as she glanced around the small market, taking in her surroundings, and I could practically see her wondering why I was touching her this way in public. Well then, let's agree again not to bring up children. It does nothing but cause problems between us, I said and gave her a quick kiss to her lips, followed by another. My lips lingered on hers, and her small hands pushed into the pockets of my jacket. I love you, Hardin, she said when grumpy Gloria, the cashier we'd laughed about many times, cleared her throat. I love you, Tess. I will love you enough that you won't even need children, I promised her. She turned away from me to hide her frown, I know. But right then I didn't care because I figured the question was settled and I'd gotten what I wanted. As I continue to drive, I begin to wonder, has there ever been a time in my life when I wasn't a selfish prick? Chapter 86. Tessa. As I'm plodding from my room to the couch with a copy of Wuthering Heights in hand, Kimberly says with a beautiful wide smile, you're in a funk, Tessa, and as your friend and mentor, it's my responsibility to get you out of it. Her blonde hair is straight and glossy, and her makeup is too perfect. She's one of those women that other women love to hate. Mentor? Really? I giggle, and she rolls her heavily shadowed eyes. Okay, maybe not so much of a mentor. But a friend, she corrects herself. I'm not in a funk. I just have a lot of coursework to do, and I just don't feel like going anywhere tonight, I say. You are 19, girl, act like it. When I was 19, I was out all the time. I barely showed up for any of my classes. I dated boys many, many, boys. Her heel taps on the concrete floor. Did you, now? Christian cuts in as he enters the room. He's unwrapping some sort of tape from around his hands. None as wonderful as you, of course. Kim winks at him, and he laughs. He grins. That's what I get for dating such a young woman. I have to compete with still fresh memories of college-age men. His green eyes shine with humor. Hey, I'm not that much younger than you, she says with a smack to his chest. Twelve years, he points out. Kimberly rolls her eyes. Yes, but you're a young soul. Unlike Tessa here, who behaves as if she's 40. Sure, honey. He tosses the used tape into a waste paper basket. Now, go on and enlighten the girl about how not to behave during college. He gives her one last smile, smacks her on her ass, and disappears, leaving her grinning from ear to ear. I love that man so much, she tells me, and I nod along, because I know it's true. I really wanted you to come along with us tonight. Christian and his partners just opened a new jazz club downtown. It's beautiful, and I'm sure you'd have an amazing time. Christian owns a jazz club? I ask. He invested in it, so he didn't actually do any work, she whispers with a sly smile. They have guest musicians on Saturdays, sort of an open mic type thing. I shrug. Maybe next weekend? The last thing I want to do right now is get dressed and go out to any type of club. Fine, next weekend, I'm holding you to that. Smith doesn't want to come either. I've tried to convince him, but you know how he is. He lectured me on how jazz is nothing compared to classical music. She laughs. So his sitter will be here in a few hours. I can watch him, I offer. I'll be here, anyway. No, honey, you don't have to. I know, but I want to. Well, it would be kinda great, and so much easier. He doesn't like the sitter, for some reason. He doesn't like me either. I laugh. True, but he talks to you more than he does to most people. She looks down at the engagement ring on her finger, and then up to Smith's school portrait hanging over the mantel. He's such a sweet boy just very guarded, she says quietly, almost as an afterthought. A doorbell sounds, breaking the moment. Kimberly looks at me quizzically. Now, who the heck would be coming here in the middle of the afternoon, she asks, as if I could possibly know the answer. I stand there, looking at a really cute picture of Smith on the wall. He's such a serious little kid. Like a little engineer or mathematician, almost. Well 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 look who it is. Kimberly calls from the door. When I turn to see what she's talking about, my mouth falls open. Harden. His name falls from my lips without a single thought, 
and an immediate surge of adrenaline at the sight of him propels me across the room. My socks make me slide on the hardwood floor, nearly causing me to fall on my face. Once I'm steady enough to continue, I latch myself onto him, hugging him tighter than maybe I ever have before. Chapter 87. Harden. I nearly have a goddamn heart attack when Tessa stumbles and starts to fall, but she quickly collects herself and hurls herself into my arms. This is sure as hell not the reaction I had expected. I thought I would be granted with an uncomfortable hello and a smile that didn't meet her eyes. But man, was I wrong. Very wrong. Tessa tightens her arms around my neck and I bury my head in her hair. The sweet scent of her shampoo fills my senses and I'm momentarily overwhelmed by her presence, warm and welcoming, in my arms. Hi, I finally say, and she glances up at me. You're freezing, she remarks. Her hands move to my cheeks, instantly heating them. It's freezing rain out there, and it's worse back home my home, I mean, I correct myself. Her eyes quickly dart to the floor, before looking back up at me. What are you doing here, she practically whispers to me trying her best to shield the question from our company. I called Christian on the way up, I inform Kimberly, who continues to full glare at me, a smirk playing on her painted lips. Couldn't stay away, could you? She mouths to me behind Tessa's back. That woman is the biggest ballbuster around. I'm not sure how Christian puts up with her, and willingly at that. You can stay in the room across from Tessa's, she can show you, Kimberly announces and then disappears. I detach myself from Tessa and give her a little smile. I, I'm sorry. Tessa stutters, looking around the room and blushing. I don't know why I did that. I, it's just nice to see a familiar face. It's good to see you too, I tell her, trying to free her of her embarrassment. It's not like I let go, because I didn't want to hold her. Her lack of confidence always has her interpret things in negative ways. I slipped on the floor, she blurts out, then flushes again as I bite down on the inside of my cheek, trying my best not to laugh at her. Yeah, I saw it. I can't help the small chuckle that escapes from me, and she shakes her head, laughing at herself. Are you really staying? She asks. Yes, if that's okay with you. Her eyes are bright, and a lighter shade of blue-gray than usual. Her hair is down, slightly wavy and unstyled. Not a trace of makeup mars her complexion, and she looks absolutely fucking perfect. The number of hours that I've spent picturing her face in front of me did not adequately prepare me for the moment when I'm finally able to look at her again. My mind can't possibly catch all of her, all the details the freckle just below her neckline, the curve of her lips, the brilliance of her eyes, it's fucking impossible. Her t-shirt hangs loose on her body, and those hideous fluffy cloud pants cover her legs. She keeps adjusting her shirt, tugging it down, playing with the collar. She's the only girl I've ever seen who can manage to wear these ugly ass clothes to bed, but somehow still looks so damn sexy. Through the white shirt, I can see her black bra she's wearing, that black lace one that I love. I wonder if she's aware that I can see right through her shirt. What changed your mind? And where's the rest of your stuff? Tessa asks as she leads me down the hallway. Everyone else's rooms are upstairs she informs me, unaware of my perverted thoughts. Or maybe she's not this is all I brought. It's only for one night I tell her, and she stops in front of me. You're only staying one night? She says, her eyes searching my face. Yeah, what did you think? That I was moving here? Of course she did. She always has too much faith in me. No. She looks away. I don't know. I thought a little longer than that, though. And now this is where it gets awkward. I knew it would. Here's the room. She opens the door for me, but I don't step inside. Your room is just across the hall? My voice breaks, and I sound like a damned fool. Yeah, she mutters, looking down at her fingers. Cool, I remark dumbly. You're sure it's okay that I'm here, right? Yes, of course. You know I missed you. The excitement on her face seems to vanish as the memory of my previous actions, being an asshole in general, and refusing to come to Seattle specifically, looms unspoken over our heads. I'll never forget the way she ran to me, literally, when she saw me at the door, there was such emotion on her face, so much longing, and I felt it too, 
more than she did. I've been insane without her. Yeah, but the last time that we saw one another in that apartment I was basically kicking you out. I watch her face change as my words remind her of what took place. I can literally see the fucking wall rising up between us as she gives me a fake smile. I don't know why I brought that up, I say and wipe my wrist across my forehead. Her eyes move to another room. Her room. Then turning to the door we're standing in front of, she says, you can put your stuff in here. Grabbing my bag from me, she heads inside and unzips it on the bed. I watch as she pulls the wadded up t-shirts and boxers out of the bag and scrunches her nose. Are these clean? She asks. I shake my head. The boxers are. She holds the bag at arm's length. I don't even want to know what the apartment looks like. The corners of her mouth lift into a smug smile. Good thing you won't ever see it again, then, I tease her. Her smile fades. What a shitty joke, what the fuck is wrong with me? I didn't mean it that way, I say quickly, desperate to recover from my poor choice of words. It's fine. Relax, okay? Her voice is gentle. It's only me, Harden. I know. I take a deep breath and continue, it just feels like it's been so fucking long, and we're in that weird middle, half relationship shit, that we are really shitty at. And we haven't seen each other, and I've just missed you, and I hope you missed me too. Wow. I really said, but all way too fast. She smiles. I did. You did what? I press for the exact words. I missed you. I told you that every day we've talked. I know. I step closer to her. I just wanted to hear it again. I reach out and tuck her hair behind her ears, using both hands, and she leans into me. When did you get here? A small voice suddenly says, and Tessa jumps away from me. Great. Just fucking great. And there's Smith, standing in the doorway of Tessa's new bedroom. Just now, I reply, hoping that he'll leave the room, so I can continue what almost was started moments ago. Why did you come, he asks and enters the room. I point to Tessa, who is now more than five feet away from me, pulling my clothes out of my bag and gathering them in her arms. I came to see her. Oh, he quietly replies, staring down at his feet. Do you not want me here? I inquire. I don't mind, he says with a shrug, and I smile at him. Good, because I wouldn't have left if you did. I know. Smith smiles back and leaves Tessa and me alone. Thank fucking God. He likes you, Tessa says. He's okay. I shrug, and she laughs. Do you like him too, she accuses. No, I don't. I said simply, he's okay. She rolls her eyes. Sure. She's right, I do sort of like him. More than any other five-year-old that I've ever met, at least. I'm watching him tonight, while Kim and Christian go to a club opening, she says. Why aren't you going along? I don't know, I just didn't want to. Hmm. I pinch my lips between my fingers to hide my smile from her. I'm thrilled that she didn't want to go out, and I find myself hoping that she'd planned on spending her evening talking to me on the phone. Tessa gives me a weird look. You can go if you'd like, you don't have to stay in with me. I give her an indignant look. What? I didn't arrive all this way to go out to some shitty club without you. You don't want me to stay with you? Her eyes meet mine, and she presses my clothes to her chest. Yes, of course I want you to stay. Good, because I wouldn't have left if you didn't, I joke. She doesn't smile the way Smith did, but she does roll her eyes, which is just as cute. Where are you going? I ask when I notice her inching toward the door with my things. She gives me a look that's both funny and sultry. To do your laundry, she says, and disappears into the hall. Chapter 88. Tessa. My thoughts are racing as I start the washing machine. Hardin came here, to Seattle, and I didn't have to ask or beg him. He came of his own accord. Even if it's only for one night, it means so much to me, and I hope that it will turn out to be a step in the right direction for us. I'm still so conflicted, when it comes to our relationship we always have so many problems, so many pointless fights. We're such different people, and I'm at a point now where I'm not sure it will ever work. But right now, now that he's here with me, 
I want nothing more than to try this long distance half relationship half friendship and see where it takes us. I knew he'd show up, Kimberly says from behind me. When I turn around, I see her leaning against the doorframe of the laundry room. I didn't, I tell her. She gives me an oh please look. You had to know he would. I've never seen a couple like the two of you. I sigh. We aren't exactly a couple you ran into his arms like something out of a movie. He's been here for less than 15 minutes, and you're already doing his laundry. She nods to the machine. Well, his clothes are filthy, I say, ignoring the first part of her remark. You two just can't stay away from one another. It's really something to watch. I do wish you were coming out tonight, so you could get dressed up and show him what he's missing by not being here in Seattle with you. She winks and then leaves me alone in the laundry room. She's right about Hardin and me not being able to stay away from each other. It's always been that way, since the day I met him. Even when I tried to convince myself that I didn't want him, I couldn't ignore the fluttering I felt inside me every time we ran into each other. Back then, Hardin always seemed to appear wherever I was granted, I did go to his fraternity house every chance I could. I hated it there, but something inside me drew me to the place, knowing that if I went, I would see him. I didn't admit it then, not even to myself, but I longed for his company, even when he was being cruel to me. The memories feel so ancient and almost dreamlike as I recall the way he used to stare at me during class, then roll his eyes when I said hello. The washing machine makes a random little beep, bringing me back to reality, and I hurry down the hallway to the guest room that has been designated as Hardin's for the night. The room is empty. Hardin's empty bag is still on the bed, but he's nowhere to be found. I walk across the hall and find him standing over the desk in my room. His fingertips are tracing the cover of one of my notebooks. What are you doing in here? I ask. I just wanted to see where you're living now. I wanted to see your room. Oh. I notice the way his brows pull together when he calls it my room. Is this for a class? He asks, holding up the black leather notebook. It's for creative writing. I nodded him. Did you read it? I can't help but feel a little nervous at the thought that he may have. I've only completed one assignment so far, but like everything else in my life, it ended up relating to him. A little. It's just an assignment, I say, fumbling to explain myself. We were asked to do a freestyle essay as the first assignment and, it's good, really good, he says, praising me, and places the book back on the desk for a moment, before picking it up again, and opening it to the first page. Who I am. He reads the first line out loud. Please don't, I beg. He gives me a questioning little smirk. Since when are you shy about showing your schoolwork? I'm not. It's just that piece is personal. I'm not even sure if I want to turn it in. I read your religion journal, he says, and my heart stops. What? I pray that I heard him wrong. He wouldn't. He couldn't have read it I read it. You left it at the apartment, and I found it. This is humiliating. I stand in silence, while Hardin stares at me from across the room. Those were private thoughts that I never expected anyone to read, except my professor, maybe. I'm mortified that Hardin poured over my deepest thoughts. You weren't supposed to read those. Why would you? I ask, trying not to look at him. Every entry was about me, he says by way of defending himself. That's not the point, Hardin. My stomach is in my throat making it hard to breathe. I was going through a really bad time, and those were private thoughts for my journal. You were never meant to, they were really good, Tess. So good. It hurt me to read the way you were feeling, but the words, what you had to say, it was perfect. I know he's trying to compliment me, but it only embarrasses me further. How would you feel, if I read something you wrote to express your feelings in a private way? I ignore the compliments from him about my writing. His eyes flash with panic, and I tilt my head in confusion. What? Nothing, is all he says, shaking his head. Chapter 89. Hardin. The look in her eyes almost makes me stop, but I have to be honest, and I want her to know how interesting I found her writing. I've read it at least ten times, I admit. Her white eyes don't meet mine, but her lips part slightly and she replies, you have. Don't be ashamed. It's only me.
remember? I smile at her, and she steps closer to me. I know, but I probably sounded so pathetic. I wasn't thinking clearly when I was writing them. I press my fingers against her lips to silence her. No, you didn't. They were brilliant. As she tries to speak beneath my fingers, and I press them harder. Are you done yet? I grin at her, and she nods. Slowly, I remove my fingers from her lips, and her tongue darts out to wet them. I can't help but stare. I have to kiss you I whisper, our faces mere inches apart. Her eyes look into mine, and she swallows loudly before licking her lips again. Okay she whispers back to me. Her hands are greedy as she wraps her fists around the fabric of my shirt. She pulls me closer, her breathing heavy. Just before our lips can connect, a knock sounds at the bedroom door. Tessa? Kimberly's high-pitched voice calls through the half-open door. Get rid of her, I whisper, and Tessa backs away from me. First a kid, now his mom. We might as well invite Vance to join as well. We're leaving in a few minutes, Kimberly says without coming in. Good for you. Now get the fuck out of here okay, I'll be right out, Tessa responds, and my irritation grows. Thanks, Han, Kimberly says and walks off, humming some pop song. I shouldn't have even fucking, I begin. When Tessa looks over at me, I stop myself from finishing my rude remark. It wasn't true, anyway nothing could keep me from wanting to be here right now. I have to go out there now, to watch Smith. If you want to stay in here, you can. No, I want to be wherever you are, I tell her, and she smiles. Fuck, I want to kiss her. I've missed her so much, and she says she's missed me, too why doesn't she just her hands wrap around the top of my black t-shirt, and she presses her lips against mine. I feel as if someone has plugged me into an electrical outlet, every fiber of me igniting and buzzing. Her tongue enters my mouth, pressing and caressing, and I wrap my hands around her hips. I pull her across the room until my feet hit the footboard of the bed. I lie back, and she falls gently on top of me. Wrapping her body into my arms, I turn us over, so her body is under mine. I can feel her pulse hammering under my lips as they slide down her neckline and back up to the sweet spot just under her ear. Gasps and quiet moans are my reward. Slowly, I begin what I know are torturing movements, grinding my hips against hers, pressing her into the mattress. Tessa's fingers move to touch the heated skin under my t-shirt, and her nails rake down my back. As I bring her earlobe between my lips, the image of Zed thrusting into her flashes through my mind, and I'm on my feet within seconds. What's wrong, she asks. Her lips are deep pink, and swollen from my gentle assault. I it's, it's nothing. We should um go out there. Take care of the little shit, I respond frantically. Harden, she presses. Tessa, let it go. It's nothing. Oh, you know, just that I dreamed of Zed fucking you practically through to the other side of our mattress, and now I can't stop picturing it. Okay. She lifts herself from the bed, and wipes her hands against the soft material of her pajamas. I close my eyes for a moment, trying to rid my mind of the disgusting images. If that poser asshole interrupts another second of my time with Tessa, I'll break every bone in his goddamn body. Chapter 90. Tessa. After too many kisses for Smith's liking, Kimberly and Vance. Finally leave. Each of the three times they reminded us they were only a phone call away in case there's trouble, Hardin and Smith rolled their eyes dramatically. When she pointed to the list of emergency numbers on the kitchen counter, they shared a little, cute look of disbelief. What do you want to watch? I ask Smith once their car is out of sight. He shrugs from where he's sitting on the couch and looks up at Hardin, who looks down at the kid like he's an amusing little ferret or something. Okay what about a game, do you want to play a game or something? I suggest when neither of them speaks. No, Smith replies. I think he just wants to go back to his room and do whatever the hell he was doing before Kim dragged him out here, Hardin says, and Smith nods curtly in agreement. Well okay, then. You can go back to your room Smith. Hardin and I will be out here, if you need anything. I'll be ordering dinner soon, I tell him. Can you come with me, Hardin? Smith asks in the softest tone possible. To your room? No, I'm good. Without a word, Smith climbs down from the couch, 
and walks over to the stairs. I shoot a glare at Hardin, and he shrugs his shoulders. What? Go to his room with him, I whisper. I don't want to go to his room. I want to be out here with you, he says matter-of-factly. As much as I want Hardin to stay with me, I feel bad for Smith. Come on. I nod to the blonde boy as he slowly ascends the steps. He's lonely. Damn it, fine. Hardin groans and sulks across the living room to follow Smith up the stairs. I'm still a little bothered by his odd reaction to our kiss in the bedroom. I thought it was going great, better than great, but he climbed off me so abruptly that I thought he'd been injured. Maybe after being away from me for so long he doesn't feel the same? Maybe he's not as attracted to me sexually as he once was. I know that I'm dressed in baggy pajamas, but he never had a problem with them before. Unable to come up with any reasonable explanation for his behavior, instead of letting my imagination run wild, I grabbed a small stack of takeout pamphlets that Kimberly left for us so we could figure out what to order for dinner. I decide on pizza and grab my phone before going into the laundry room. I place Hardin's clothes in the dryer and sit on the bench in the center of the room. I call for the pizza and wait while watching the machine turn around and around. Chapter 91. Hardin. As Smith walks around his bedroom, I stand in the doorway and take a mental inventory of all the shit this kid has. Man, he's spoiled as hell. What do you want to do? I ask the kid as I step into the room. I don't know. He stares at the wall. His blonde hair is combed to one side so perfectly it's almost creepy. Then why did you want me to come up here? I don't know, the little shit repeats. Stubborn little fucker. Okay well, this isn't going anywhere I trail off. Are you living here now too, with your girl? Smith suddenly blurts. No, only visiting for tonight, I say and look away from the kid. Why? His eyes home in on me. I can feel them without even glancing his way because I don't want to live here. I do, though. Sort of. Why? Do you don't like her? He questions. Yes. I like her. I laugh. I just I don't know. Why do you always ask me so many questions? I don't know, he responds simply, and pulls some sort of train set from under his bed. Don't you have any friends you can play with? I ask the boy. No. That doesn't seem right. He's an all right kid. Why not? He shrugs and disconnects a piece of the train track. His small hands disconnect another piece, and he switches the metal out with two new tracks from a box at the end of his bed. I'm sure you can make friends at school. No, I can't. Are the kids assholes to you or something? I ask him. I don't bother to correct my language. Vance has the mouth of a fucking sailor, and I'm sure his son has heard worse. Sometimes. He twists the edges of some type of wire and connects a small train car to it. The wire sparks in his hands, but he doesn't flinch. Within seconds, the train begins to move around the track, starting slowly and then gradually picking up speed. What was that that you just did? I ask him. Made it go faster. It was really slow. No wonder you don't have any friends. I laugh, but then I catch myself. Shit. He's just sitting there, staring at his train. I just meant, because you're so smart, sometimes smart people are terrible at being social, and no one likes them. Like Tessa, for example, she's too smart sometimes, and it makes people feel uncomfortable. Okay he looks over, and begins staring at me, and I can't help, but feel bad for him. I'm shit at giving advice, and I don't know why I even tried. I know what it's like to grow up not having any friends. As a child, I never had a single one until I hit puberty and started drinking, smoking pot, and hanging out with shitty people. They weren't actually my friends, anyway, they only liked me, because I did whatever the fuck I wanted to do, and that was cool to them. They didn't enjoy reading the way that I did, they only enjoyed partying. I was always that angry little boy in the corner whom no one talked to, because they were afraid of me. To this day, that hasn't changed much, really but I met Tessa. She's the only person who genuinely gives a fuck about me. She's afraid of me sometimes too, though. Images from Christmas and red wine splattered across her white cardigan bring my thoughts to life. 
I suspect that Landon cares for me too, I guess. But that's still a weird situation with him, and I'm pretty sure he only cares because of Tessa. She tends to have that power over people. Me, especially. Chapter 92. Tessa. Is your pizza good? I ask Smith from across the table. He looks up at me, mouth full, and nods his head yes. His small hands are holding a fork and knife to cut into his meal. This doesn't surprise me. When his plate is clear, he stands from the table and walks his dishes to the dishwasher, placing them inside. I'm going to retire for the night. I'm ready for bed, the little scientist announces. Hardin shakes his head in amusement over the maturity of the kid. I stand up and ask, do you need anything? Water, or to be walked to your room? But he declines and grabs his blanket from the couch before heading up to his bedroom. I watch Smith disappear upstairs, then sit back down and realize that Hardin has spoken less than 10 words to me in the last hour. He's kept his distance and I can't help but find myself comparing his behavior tonight to the way he spoke during our phone calls this week. A small part of me wishes we were on the phone now instead of sitting silently on the couch. Front or, followed by another couple. A tall blonde woman dressed in a short gold dress saunters across the hardwood floor. I take one glance at her sky-high heels, and my ankles start to ache for her. She gives me a smile and a wave as she follows Kimberly through the foyer and into the living room. Hardin appears in the hallway, but doesn't make a move to enter the room. Sasha, this is Tessa and Hardin, Kimberly kindly introduces us. It's nice to meet you. I smile, hating that I didn't put on better-looking pajamas. You too, Sasha responds, but she's looking directly to Hardin, who looks back at her for a moment, but doesn't otherwise greet her or come fully into the living room. Sasha is a friend of Christian's business partner Kimberly informs us. Well, informs me, because Hardin isn't paying them any attention, having fixed his eyes on the wildlife program I ended up landing on. And this is Max, who does business with Christian. The man, who had been joking and laughing with Christian, steps around from behind Sasha, and when I finally get a look at him, I'm surprised to see Ken's friend from college, that girl Lillian's father. Max I repeat, discreetly staring at Hardin and trying to draw his attention to the familiar face in front of us. Catching on, Kimberly looks back and forth between Max and me. You two have met before? Only once, at Sandpoint, I respond. Max's dark eyes are intimidating, and he has an overpowering presence that immediately claims the room is his, but his cold features do soften slightly at my reminder. Ah, yes. You're Hardin Scott's friend, he says, drawing the last word out with a smile. Actually, she's Hardin starts, finally joining us in the living room. I watch in annoyance as Sasha's eyes follow Hardin's every movement as he crosses the room. She adjusts the golden straps of her dress and licks her lips. I couldn't be more irritated with myself for wearing these damn cloud pants if I tried. Hardin's eyes flicker to her, and I watch as they slowly rake down her body taking in her tall yet curvy frame, before his attention turns to Max. She's not just a friend, Hardin finishes just as Max's hand darts out for a quick and awkward handshake. I see. The older man smiles. Well, either way, she's a lovely girl. She is, Hardin mutters. I can sense his annoyance at Max's presence. Kimberly, the perfect hostess as always, walks over to the bar and gathers glasses for their guests. She politely takes drink orders, while I try not to stare at Sasha as she introduces herself to Hardin for the second time. He gives her a brisk nod and sits down on the couch. A pang of disappointment hits me when he leaves a large space between us. Why do I feel so clingy all of a sudden? Is it because Sasha is so beautiful, or is it the way that Hardin's eyes travel down her body, or how weird he's been all night? How's Lillian? I ask to break the awkwardness and the tension and the aching jealousy that's stirring inside of me. She's fine. She's been busy with university, he coolly states. Kimberly hands him a glass of brown liquor and he gulps half of it down within seconds. He raises his brow to Christian. Bourbon? Only the best, Christian responds with a grin. You should call Lillian up sometime. You'd be a good influence on her. 
Max's eyes move to harden. I don't think she needs any influence, I retort. I didn't care much for Lillian, due to my jealousy, but I feel a strong need to defend her against her father. I can't help but think that he's referring to her sexual orientation, and that bothers me immensely. Oh, I beg to differ. He smiles a bleached white smile, and I sink back against the couch cushions. This whole exchange has been uncomfortable. Max is charming and rich, but I can't ignore the darkness that lurks within his deep brown eyes and the hidden malice in his wide smile. Why is he here with Sasha, anyway? He's a married man, and by the short cut of her dress and the way she smiles at him, they don't appear to be only on friendly terms. Lillian is a regular sitter. Kimberly chimes in. Small world. Hardin rolls his eyes so as to appear as uninterested as possible, but I know he's fuming. It is, isn't it? Max grins at Hardin. His British accent is thicker than either Hardin's or Christian's, and not nearly as pleasant to listen to. Tessa, go upstairs, Hardin quietly instructs me. Max and Kimberly both look at him, making it known that they heard his command. This situation is even more awkward now than it was only seconds ago. Now that everyone's heard Hardin tell me to go upstairs, I definitely don't want to oblige. However, I know Hardin and know that he'll make sure I get upstairs, whether he has to carry me or not. I think she should stay and have some wine or a shot of this bourbon. It's aged and very good, Kimberly says as she rises to her feet and pads over to the little bar. Which will it be? She smiles, clearly defying Hardin. He glares at her and presses his lips into a thin hard line. I want to laugh at the way Kimberly is challenging Hardin or leave the room, preferably both, but Max is watching our exchange with more curiosity than seems necessary, and I stay put. I'll have a glass of wine, I say. Kimberly nods, pours the white liquid into a long stem glass, and brings it to me. The space between Hardin and me seems to be growing by the second, and I can practically see the heat rolling off him in small waves. I take a small sip of the crisp wine, and Max finally looks away from me. Hardin is staring at the wall. His mood has drastically changed since we kissed, and that really worries me. I thought he'd be excited, happy, and most of all, I thought he'd be turned on and want more, the way he always does, the way I do. Do you two live here, in Seattle? Sasha asks Hardin. I take another sip of wine. I've been drinking a lot lately. I don't. He doesn't look at her as he answers. Hmm, where is it that you live? Not in Seattle. If this conversation were happening in any other circumstance, I would scold him for being so rude, but right now I'm happy that he is. Sasha frowns and leans against Max. He looks at me before gently guiding her in the opposite direction. I already know you're having an affair, so don't play coy now. Sasha stays quiet, and Kimberly looks to Christian for help to turn the conversation to more pleasant matters. Well, Christian clears his throat. The club opening was great. Who knew we'd have such a turnout? It was brilliant, that band I can't recall the name, but the last one Max begins. The Reford something Kimberly suggests. No, that wasn't it, love. Christian chuckles, and Kimberly walks over to sit on his lap. Well, whoever they are, we need to get them booked for next weekend too, Max says. Within minutes of the start of their business talk, Hardin turns and disappears down the hallway he's usually more polite, Kimberly tells Sasha. No, he's not. But we wouldn't have him any other way. Christian laughs, and the rest of the room joins in. I'm going to I begin. Go on. Kimberly waves me off, and I give a small good night wave to the guests. By the time I reach the end of the hallway, Hardin is already in the guest room, and has closed the door. I hesitate outside of the room for a moment before turning the knob and pushing the door open. When I finally enter, Hardin is pacing back and forth across the length of the room. Is something wrong? I ask him. No. Are you sure, because you've been weird ever since, I'm fine. I'm just irritated. He sits down at the edge of the bed and rubs his palms against the knees of his jeans. I love his new jeans. I recognize them from our, his, closet at the apartment. Trish got them for him for Christmas, and he hated them. And why's that? 
I quietly ask, making sure to keep my voice from traveling down the hall and into the living room. Max is a prick, Hardin booms. He clearly doesn't care if he's heard. Laughing, I whisper, yeah, he is. He was just asking for me to lose my shit when he was being rude to you, he breaths. He wasn't being rude to me, specifically. I think that's just his personality. I shrug my shoulders, a gesture that doesn't really calm Harden. Well, either way, I don't fucking like him, and it's annoying that we have one night together, and it's with a full house. Harden brushes his hair back from his forehead and grabs a pillow to lie back on. I know. I agree. I hope Max and his mistress leave soon. I hate that he's cheating on his wife. Denise seems so nice. I don't give a shit about that, really. I just don't like him, Hardin says. I'm a little surprised by his immediate brushing off such a betrayal. Don't you feel bad for her? Even a little bit? I'm sure she has no idea about Sasha. He waves his hand in the air and then tucks his arm behind his head. I'm sure she knows. Max is an asshole. She can't be that stupid. I picture Max's wife sitting in a mansion in the hill somewhere, wearing an expensive dress, full hair and makeup, waiting for her unfaithful husband to return home. The thought saddens me, and the best I can hope for is that she has a friend too. The thought surprises me that I would wish for her to do the same thing back to him, but her husband is in the wrong here, and though I barely know her, I want her to find some happiness, even if it's not exactly the best decision. Either way, it's still wrong, I insist. Yeah, but that's marriage for you. Cheating, lying, so on and so on. That's not always the case. Nine times out of ten. He shrugs. I hate the way he views marriage so negatively. No, that's not true. I cross my arms over my chest. You're going to argue with me over marriage, again? I don't think we should go there, he warns. His eyes meet mine, and he takes a deep breath. I want to battle this out with him, tell him that he's wrong, and change his view on marriage, but I know it's pointless. Hardin made up his mind about such things long, before he met me. You're right, we shouldn't talk about this. Especially when you're already wound up. I'm not wound up, he scoffs. Okay. I roll my eyes at him, and he rises to his feet. Stop rolling your eyes at me, he snaps. I can't help but roll my eyes, again. Tessa he growls. I stand still, unmoving and unwavering. He has no reason to be short with me. Max's being a pompous jerk is in no way my fault. This is a typical Hart and Scott tantrum, and I'm not caving this time. You're only here for one night, remember? I remind him and watches the hardness and energy slip from his features. He continues to watch me, though, expecting a fight. I'm not giving him one. Damn it, you're right. I'm sorry, he finally sighs, impressing me with a sudden change in his mood and his ability to calm himself down. Come here. He opens his arms, the way Hardin always does, and I walk into them, the way I haven't for so long. He doesn't say anything. He only wraps his arms around me and rests his chin on top of my head. His scent is overpowering, his. Breathing has slowed since his little hissy fit, and he is warm, so warm. Seconds, or maybe minutes later, he pulls away from me and presses his thumb under my chin. I'm sorry for being a dick. I don't know what my problem was. Max just bugs the shit out of me, or maybe it was the babysitting, or that obnoxious Stacy. I don't know, but I'm sorry. Sasha. I correct him with a smile. Same thing, a whore is a whore is a whore. Harden. I gently swat at his chest. The muscles underneath feel harder than I remember. He's been working out daily briefly, my thoughts travel to what he looks like under his black t-shirt, and I wonder if his body has changed since I last laid eyes on it. Just saying. He shrugs and brushes his fingertips over the soft line of my jaw. I really am sorry. I don't want to ruin my time with you. Forgive me? His cheeks flush, and his voice is so soft, and his fingertips are gently scraping against my skin, and it feels so good. My eyes flutter closed as he traces the outline of my lips with his thumb. Answer me he softly presses. I always do, don't I? I say with a breath. 
I rest both of my hands on his hips, my thumbs pressing into the bare skin under his t-shirt. I expect to feel his lips on mine, but when I open my eyes, his guard has been drawn up. I hesitate, but ask, is something wrong? I had he stops mid-sentence. I have a headache. Do you need something? I can ask him if, no, not her. I think I just need to sleep or something. It's late, anyway. My heart sinks at his words. What is going on with him, and why doesn't he want to kiss me again? Only moments ago he told me that he didn't want to ruin our short time together, yet now he wants to go to sleep? I sigh out a quiet okay. I'm not going to beg Hardin to stay awake and spend time with me. I'm embarrassed by his rejection, and honestly I do need a moment alone without his minty breath fanning across my cheeks and his green eyes piercing into mine, clouding the smidge of judgment I have left. Still, I linger a little, waiting for him to ask if he can sleep in my room or vice versa. He doesn't. I'll see you in the morning, then, he asks. Yeah, sure. I leave the room before I embarrass myself further and lock my bedroom door behind me. Pathetically, I pad back across the room and unlock the door, hoping that maybe, just maybe, he will come through it. Chapter 93. Harden. Fuck. Fuck. I have been containing my anger, for the most part at least, all week. It's becoming harder and harder to do so, when Zed keeps creeping his way into my head, and it's driving me fucking mad. I know I'm batshit crazy for obsessing over this, and I have no doubt Tessa would agree, if I told her, why I'm so wound up. It's not only Zed, it's Max and his mocking tone with Tessa, his whore and her gawking at me, Kimberly challenging me when I told Tessa to go upstairs, it's all one big fucking annoyance, and my control is slipping. I can feel my nerves being tightened to the brink of snapping, and the only way to relax them is to punt something or bury myself into Tessa and forget about everything, but I can't even fucking do that. I should be sinking myself inside of her right now, over and over until the goddamn sun comes up to make up for the last week of hell without her touch. Leave it to me to fuck this night up. I'm sure she's not surprised, though. It's what I do without fail, every time. I lie down on the bed and stare back and forth between the ceiling and the clock. Eventually it's two in the morning. The annoying voices from the living room halted over an hour ago, and I was glad to hear the sounds of fawning goodbyes and then. Vance and Kim's footsteps coming up the stairs. From across the hall, I feel it. I feel the pull, the fucking magnetic charge, drawing me to Tessa and begging me to be at her side. Ignoring the overwhelming electricity, I climb out of the bed and change into the clean black shorts that Tessa has folded and placed on the dresser. I know Vance has a gym in this massive house somewhere. I need to find it before I lose what's left of my fucking mind. Chapter 94. Tessa. I can't sleep. I've tried to close my eyes and block out the world, leave the chaos and stress of the mess that is my love life, but I can't. It's impossible. It's impossible to fight the irresistible power that draws me to Hardin's room, that begs me to be near him. He's being so distant, and I have to know why. I have to know if he's behaving this way because of something I did or because of something I didn't do. I have to know that it had nothing to do with Sasha and her tiny gold dress or Hardin losing interest in me. I have to know. Hesitantly, I climb out of the bed and tug on the small cord to bring the lamp to life. I pull the thin band from around my wrist and gather my hair into my hands, pulling it into a ponytail. As quietly as possible, I tiptoe across the hall and slowly turn the handle on the guest room door. It opens with a low creak, and I'm surprised to find the lamp on and the bed empty. A pile of black sheets and blankets are pushed against the edge of the bed, but Hardin isn't in the room. My heart sinks at the thought that he's left Seattle and gone back home, to his home. I know things were awkward between us but we should be able to talk about whatever it happens to be that is weighing on Hardin's mind. Scanning the room, I'm relieved to see his bag still on the floor, the piles of clean and folded clothes knocked over, but at least still there. I've loved seeing the changes in Hardin since his arrival only hours ago. He's been sweeter, calmer, and he actually apologized to me without me having to pull the words from him. Regardless of the fact 
that he's being cold and distant right now. I can't ignore the changes that a week apart seems to have made and the positive impact that the distance between us has had on him. I quietly pad down the hallway in search of him. The house is dark, the only light coming from small night lights lined along the floor of the halls. The bathrooms, living room, and kitchen are empty, and I don't hear a single noise coming from upstairs. He has to be upstairs, though maybe he's in the library? I keep my fingers crossed that I don't wake anyone during my search, and just as I close the door to the dark and empty library, I see a thin line of light creeping from the door at the end of the long corridor. During my brief stay here, I haven't made it to this part of the house, though I think Kimberly had vaguely indicated that this is where the theater and the gym are. Apparently, Christian spends hours in the gym. The door is unlocked, and I push it open with ease. I feel a momentary spark of worry as I entertain the idea that it's Christian, not Hardin, who's in the room. That would be incredibly awkward, and I pray it isn't the case. All four walls of the room are mirrored from floor to ceiling and lined with large, intimidating machines, a treadmill being the only recognizable one. Weights and more weights cover the far wall, and most of the floor is padded. My eyes move to the mirrored walls, and my insides liquefy at the sight of them. Harden, four Hardens, actually, are reflected in the mirrors. He's shirtless, and his movements are aggressively quick. His hands are wrapped in the same black tape that I've seen on Christians each day this week. Hardin's back is to me, his hard muscles straining under pale skin as he lifts his foot to kick the large black bag hanging from the ceiling. His fist strikes out next. A loud thud follows his movement, and he repeats it with the other fist. I watch as he continues to punch and kick the bag. He looks so angry, and hot, and sweaty, and I can barely think straight as I watch him. With swift movements, he hits with his left leg, then his right, and then both fists smash into the bag with such fluidity, it's incredible to watch. His skin is shining and covered in sweat, and his chest and stomach look slightly different than before, more defined. He simply looks larger. The metal chain attached to the ceiling looks like it's going to snap from the force of Hardin's aggression. My mouth is dry, and my thoughts are sluggish as I watch him and listen to the angry groans that escape as he begins using only his fists against the bag. I don't know if it's the soft moan that falls from my lips at watching him, or if he somehow felt my presence, but he suddenly stops. The bag continues to sway on its chain, and while keeping his eyes on me, Hardin reaches out one hand to stop it. I don't want to be the first to speak, but he gives me no choice as he continues to stare at me with wide and angry eyes. Hey, I say, my voice hoarse and tiny. His chest rises and falls rapidly. Hi, he says, panting. What, um, I try to contain myself, what are you doing? Couldn't sleep, he breathes heavily. What are you doing up? He gathers his black t-shirt from the floor and wipes the moisture from his face. I gulp. I can't seem to find the strength to look away from his sweat-soaked body. Um, same as you couldn't sleep. I smile weakly, and my eyes flicker to his toned torso, the muscles moving in sync with his hard breaths. He nods. His eyes don't meet mine, and I can't help but ask, did I do something? If I did, we could just talk about it and work it out. No, you didn't do anything. Then tell me what's wrong please, Hardin. I need to know what's going on. I gather as much confidence as I can manage. Do you never mind? The ounce of confidence I had slips away under his stare. Do I what? He sits down on a long black cushion, which I think is some sort of weight bench. After wiping the t-shirt over his face again, he wraps it around his head, restraining his damp and mess of hair. The impromptu headband is oddly endearing and very attractive, so much so that I find myself fumbling for words. I'm just beginning to wonder if maybe, possibly, you you're starting, to not like me as much as you did. The question sounded much better inside of my head. When said out loud, it sounds pathetic and needy. What? He drops his hands onto his knees. What are you talking about? Are you still as attracted to me physically? I ask. I wouldn't feel so ashamed or insecure if he hadn't rejected me earlier tonight. That, and if Ms. 
long legs short dress hadn't been fawning over him right in front of me. Not to mention the way his eyes lingered as they slowly took in her body, what where is this coming from? As his chest rises and falls, the sparrow's ink just under his collarbone appeared to be fluttering along with his breathing. Well although I take a few steps farther into the room, I make sure to leave a few feet between Hardin and me. Earlier when we were kissing you stopped, and you've barely touched me since, and then you just up, and went to bed. Do you actually think that I'm not attracted to you anymore? He opens his mouth to continue, but suddenly closes it again and sits silently. It has crossed my mind, I admit. The padded flooring has suddenly become fascinating as I stare down at it. That is fucking insane, he begins. Look at me. My eyes meet his, and he sighs deeply before continuing. I can't begin to fathom why you would ever consider the notion that I'm not attracted to you, Tessa. He seems to think over his response and adds, well, I guess I can see why you would think that, because of how I acted earlier, but it's not true. That literally could not be further from the fucking truth. The ache in my chest slowly begins to dissolve. Then what is it? You're going to think I'm fucking morbid. Oh no. Why? Tell me please, I beg him. I watch his frustrated fingers run over the slight stubble on his chin. It's barely there, probably only a day's worth of not shaving. Just hear me out before you get mad, okay? I nod slowly, an action that completely contradicts the paranoid thoughts that are beginning to flutter through me. I had this dream, well, nightmare, actually my chest tightens, and I pray that it's not as bad as he's making it out to be. Half of me is relieved that he's upset over a nightmare, not an actual event, but the other half aches for him. He's been alone all week, and it hurts to know that his nightmares have returned. Go on, I gently encourage him. About you and said. Oh boy. What do you mean? I ask. He was at our, my, apartment, and I came home to find him in between your legs. You were moaning his name and, okay, okay, I get it, I say, raising a hand to stop him. The pained expression on his face compels me to keep my hand up for a few seconds to keep him silent, but then he says, no, let me tell you. I'm extremely uncomfortable about having to listen to Hardin talk about said and me in bed, but if he feels like he needs to tell me, if telling me will help him work it out, I'll bite my tongue and listen. He was on top of you, fucking you, in our bed. You said that you loved him. He grimaces. All of this tension and all of Hardin's strange and awkward behavior, since he came to Seattle stemmed from a dream he had about me and said. At least this helps explain his middle of the night demand last night that I call said and take back the invitation to visit me in Seattle that I agreed to. As I stare across the room at the green-eyed, grief-stricken man with his face resting on his hands, my earlier paranoia and frustration dissolve like sugar on my tongue. Chapter 95 Harden. When my name escapes her lips, it comes out on a breath, soft, her tongue caressing the word. As if in saying that one word she summed up all of her feelings for me, all of the times I've touched her, all of the times she's proved that she loves me, even if part of me still can't believe it. Tessa walks closer, and I can see the sympathetic look in her eyes. Why didn't you just tell me earlier, she asks. I look down and pick at the thick tape wrapped around my hands. It was only a dream. You know something like that would never actually happen, she says. When I look up at her, the pressure in my eyes, in my chest, is unrelenting. It's stuck in my head, I can't stop it from replaying it. He was fucking taunting me the entire time, smirking as he fucked you. Tessa's small hands quickly move to cover her ears, and she crinkles her nose in displeasure. Then, looking up at me, she drops her arm slowly. Why do you think you had that dream? I don't know, probably because you agreed to let him visit you here. I didn't know what else to say, and we were well, we still are, in that weird place, she mutters. I don't want him near you. I know it's fucked up, but I don't give a shit. Honestly, Zed is the line for me. It will always be that way. No amount of kickboxing will change that. Weird place or not, you are only for me. Not just sexually, but entirely. I can't stand you being in any sort of emotional relationship with that guy. He hasn't been near me 
Since he took me to my mother's house that night, she reminds me. But the panic burning inside of me doesn't budge. I look down, breathe in and out deeply, to try to calm myself down a little. But, she takes a step closer, the she remains just out of reach, if it will make you stop thinking these things, I'll tell him not to visit. My eyes dart to her beautiful face. You will. I expected more of a fight from her. Yes, I will. I don't want it weighing on you like this. With nervous eyes, she looks down at my chest and back up to my face. Come here. I lift one bandaged hand to beckon her. Because her feet are moving too slowly, I lean up and grab hold of her arm, wrapping my hand around her elbow to bring her to me more quickly. My breathing has yet to return to normal. I have all this adrenaline rushing through my body. I couldn't help but beat the shit out of that damn bag, but my hands and feet are aching, I still haven't released all of my anger. There's something inside my head, just sitting in the back of my mind, nagging at me, not allowing me to release my grudge against Zed. That is, until her lips are on mine. She surprises me by pushing her tongue into my mouth and wrapping her small hands into my sweat-soaked hair, tugging hard pulling the rolled-up t-shirt from around my head and tossing it onto the floor. Tessa I gently push against her chest and remove my mouth from hers. As I sit down on the weight bench, I see her eyes narrow at me. She doesn't speak as she moves to stand in front of me. I won't put up with you rejecting me because of a dream, Harden. If you don't want me, then that's fine, but this is bullshit, she says through her teeth. As twisted as it is, her anger stirs something inside of me, causing my blood to flow straight to my dick. I've wanted this woman since the last time I was inside of her, and now here she is, wanting me, and getting frustrated that I'm stopping her from taking what she wants. Hearing her come over the phone would never be good enough. I need to feel it. A war is being fought within me. With the wild energy still pumping through my veins like fire, I finally say, I can't help it, Tessa. I know it doesn't make sense, fuck me, then, she says, and my mouth falls open. You should just fuck me until you forget about that dream, because you're here for one night, and I've missed you, but you're too stuck on imagining me with said, to even give me the attention that I want. The attention that you want? I can't help the harshness of my tone as I hear her ridiculous and untrue words. She has no idea how many times I've fucked my own hand, pretending it was her, imagining her voice in my ear telling me how much she needs me, how much she loves me. Yes, Hardin. That. I. Want. What is it exactly that you want? I ask her. Her gaze is hard and slightly unnerving. I want you to spend time with me without obsessing over said. I want you to touch me and kiss me without pulling away. That, Hardin, is what I want. She scowls and places her hands on her hips. I want you to touch me, only you, she adds, relaxing her stance by a fraction. Her words, reassuring and flattering, begin to push the paranoid thoughts from my mind, and I begin to to realize just how stupid this whole ordeal we're going through really is. She's mine, not his. He's sitting alone somewhere, and I'm here with her, and she wants me. I can't keep my eyes off her pouty lips, her angry glare, the soft curve of her tits just under the thin white t-shirt. The t-shirt that should be, but isn't, one of mine. Which is another result of my stubbornness. Tessa closes the remaining distance between us, and my somewhat shy, yet very fucking dirty, girl is looking at me, expecting a reply as her hand moves to my shoulder, and pushes me back just enough for her to climb onto my lap. Fuck this. I don't give a shit about some stupid fucking dream or our stupid fucking rule about distance. All I want is her and me, me and her, Tessa and the mess that is fucking Hardin. Her lips find their way to my neck and my fingertips press into her hips. No matter how many times I imagined it throughout the week, no fantasy will ever compare to her tongue skimming across my damp collarbone and up to that fucking spot just under my ear. Lock the door, I instruct as her teeth softly sink into my skin and she grinds her hips down against me. I'm rock fucking hard against her ridiculous fluffy fucking pants, and I need her now. I ignore the aching throb between my legs as she climbs off me and hurries across the room to do as I said. I don't waste a goddamn second when she returns. 
Her pants are pushed down her thighs, and her black panties follow, pooling around her ankles on the padded floor. I've been tortured all week, thinking about how you look when you're like this, I groan, my eyes drinking in every fucking detail of her half-naked body. So beautiful, I say with awe. When she pulls her t-shirt over her head, I can't help but lean forward and kiss the curve of her wide hips. A slow shiver rakes through her, and she reaches behind her back to unclasp her bra. Holy fuck. Out of all the times I have made love to her, I can't remember ever feeling this feverish. Even the times when she woke me up by wrapping her mouth around my cock, I never felt this fucking animalistic. I reach for her, taking one of her breasts into my mouth and one in my hand. Her hands move to my shoulders to keep her steady as I pucker my lips around her soft skin. Oh god, she moans, her nails digging into my shoulder, and I suck harder. Lower please. She attempts to guide my head down with a gentle push, so I use my teeth against her, to tease her. I run my fingertips along the underside of both of her breasts, slow and torturous this is what she gets for being so fucking tempting and teasing. Her hips move forward, and I slide my body down slightly, so that my mouth is at the perfect height to press against the swollen bud of nerve endings between her thighs. With a soft moan, she encourages me to go further, and my lips wrap around her, sucking and savoring the wetness already gathered there. She's so warm and so fucking sweet. Your fingers haven't quite satisfied you, have they? I pull away to ask her. She breathes a deep breath, her blue-gray eyes watching me as I tilt my head and run my tongue along her pubic bone. Don't tease me she whines, tugging at my hair again. Did you touch yourself off again this week, after our chat on the phone? I taunt her. She squirms and gasps, when my tongue lands exactly where she wants it. No. You're lying. I call her out. I can tell by the redness creeping from her neckline to her cheeks, and the way her eyes flicker away to the mirrored wall that she's not telling the truth. She has gotten herself off since our time on the phone, and the thought of her lying there, her legs spread open, her fingers moving over herself, her finding such pleasure from what I taught her, it makes me groan against her hot skin. Only once, she lies again. That's too bad. I completely pull away from her. Three times, okay? Tessa admits, embarrassment clear in her voice. What were you thinking about? What was it that made you come? I ask with a smirk. You, only you. Her eyes are hopeful, needy. Her admission thrills me, and I want to please her now more than ever before. I know that I can make her come in less than a minute using only my tongue, but I don't want that. With one last kiss to the apex of her thighs, I pull away and stand. Tessa is completely naked, and the mirrors fuck, the mirrors reflect her perfect body all around me, multiplying those luscious curves of hers tenfold. Her smooth skin surrounds me, making me tug my shorts and boxers down to my ankles with only one hand. I begin to pull at the tape wrapped around my knuckles, but her hand quickly darts out to stop me. No, leave it, Tessa requests, a flicker of darker lust sparking in her eyes. So she likes the tape or maybe watching me work. Out of the mirrors I do as she says, and press my body against hers, my mouth claiming hers, and I pull her down to the padded floor with me. Her hands run across my bare chest, and her eyes darken to a smoky gray. Your body is different now. I've only been working out for a week. I roll her naked body, so that she pinned underneath mine. But I can tell her tongue runs across her full lips so slowly, that I don't hesitate to press myself against her, letting her know just how fucking hard I am. She's so smooth, and so goddamn wet against me, one small movement, and I'll finally be inside her. Then it hits me. I don't have a fucking condom in here, I curse and bury my face in her shoulder. She lets out a frustrated groan, but presses her nails into me, pulling me closer. I need you, she moans, flicking her tongue across my mouth. I press against the warm, soaked flesh and slowly fill her. But I begin to try to remind her of the risks, but her eyes flutter closed, and sensation overwhelms me as I flex my hips to get deeper, as deep inside her as I possibly can. Fuck, I've missed you, I moan. I can't get over, just how fucking warm and soft she feels without the barrier of a condom. All of my common sense has been erased. All the warnings, that I've given to myself, 
and to her have vanished. I only need a few seconds, a few more thrusts into her eagerly waiting body, and I'll stop. I lift myself by stretching my arms below me, straightening them to gain leverage. I want to look at her, while I'm moving in and out of her. Her head is lifted off the padded floor, and she's staring at the spot, where our flushed bodies are connected. Look into the mirror, I say. I'll stop after three more okay, four. I can't help, but continue to move as she turns her head, to watch us in the mirrored wall. Her body looks so soft and perfect, and fucking clean, compared to the black stains covering mine. We are pure passion personified, devil and angel, and I've never been more madly fucking in love with her. I knew you liked watching, even if it's only by your own self, I fucking knew it. Her fingers press into the bottom of my spine, pulling me closer and deeper, and fuck, I have to stop now, I feel the pressure building from the bottom of my spine to my groin as I reveal one of her kinks. I have to stop I slowly pull out of her, letting both of us enjoy the lingering moment of pleasure. Her whines are quickly cut short, when my fingers slide into her with ease. I'm going to make you come now, and then take you to your bed, I promise her, and she smiles a dazed smile, before looking back into the mirror, watching me. Quiet, baby, you'll wake the others, I whisper against her. I love the noises she makes, the way she moans my name, but the last thing I need, is one of the cock-blocking vances knocking at the door. Within seconds, I feel her tighten around my fingers. I nip and suck at the nerve endings above her entrance, and she tugs at my hair, continuing to watch me fuck her with my fingers until she comes, gasping and panting my name repeatedly. Chapter 96 Tessa. Hardin's mouth leaves a trail of moisture up my stomach and along my chest before he finally places a soft kiss on my temple. I lie there on the floor next to him, trying to catch my breath and relive the events leading up to this moment. I had every intention of having a serious conversation with him about his no, our lack of communication, but watching him angrily assault that punching bag had me gasping and moaning his name within minutes. I lean up onto my elbow and look down at him. I want to reciprocate. Be my guest. He grins, his lips coated with my moisture. I move quickly, taking him into my mouth, before he catches a single breath. Fuck, he groans. The sensual noise causes my mouth to fall open too far, and he slips out, down across my tongue. Hardin bucks his hips off the floor, to meet my lips again, pressing himself inside my mouth again. Please, Tess, he begs. I can taste myself on him, but I barely notice it as he moans my name. I'm not fuck, I'm not going to last long, he pants, and I speed up. All too soon he tugs my hair and lifts my head back. I'm going to come in your mouth, then take you to the bed, and fuck you again. He runs his thumb over my lips, and playfully, I bite down gently on the pad of his finger. His head falls back, and his grip on my hair tightens as I work my mouth on him. I can feel his cock twitching, his legs stiffening as he gets closer. Fuck, Tess is so good, baby he groans as his warmth fills my mouth. I take it all, swallowing all he has to give. Standing to my feet, I wipe at my lips with one finger. Get rest he commands, tossing my bra to me. As Hardin and I hastily get rest. I catch him staring at me time and time again. Not that it comes as all that much of a surprise I haven't stopped staring at him either. Ready? He asks. I nod, and Hardin turns the lights off, closes the door behind us as if nothing happened in that room, and leads me down the hallway. We walk in comfortable silence, a vast difference from the tension between us earlier. When we reach the part of the hallway just outside my bedroom, he stops me by gently grabbing hold of my elbow. I should have told you about that nightmare instead of distancing myself from you, he says. The dim night lights along the floor cast just enough light onto his face to allow me to see the pure honesty and softness behind his eyes. We both just need to learn to communicate. You're so much more understanding than I deserve you to be, he whispers and lifts my hand to his face. His lips press against each of my knuckles, and my knees nearly buckle at the touching gesture. Hardin opens the door and takes my hand in his as he leads me to the bed. Chapter 97 Tessa Hardin's hands are still covered in rough black tape, yet they feel so tender wrapped around mine. 
I hope I haven't worn you out. He grins, brushing his taped knuckles across my cheekbone. No. The majority of the tension that I was feeling in my body has been released by his fingers. However, the not-so-subtle ache for him is still there. It always is. This is okay, right? I mean, you wanted space and this isn't exactly space. His arms wrap around me as we hesitantly stand in front of the bed. We still need space, but this is what I want right now, I explain. I'm sure this doesn't make much sense to Harden, because really, it doesn't make much sense to me, especially now, when his overwhelming presence is right here in front of me. Me too, he breathes and dips his head down to my neck. This is what's good for us to be close this way, he whispers. His arms tighten around my body, and he uses his knees to guide us onto the bed as his lips gently suck on my tingling skin. I can feel him growing hard against my leg. He's ready to go again, and so am I. I've missed you so fucking much I've missed your body, he hisses. His hands travel under my thin cotton t-shirt, and he pulls it up over my head. My ponytail catches on the neckline, but Hardin gently untangles my hair, and his fingers reach behind me to pull the band out, letting my hair fall against the mattress beneath me. He gently presses his lips to my forehead. His mood has changed since he ravished me at the gym. He was rough there, sexy and commanding. But now he's being my Hardin, the soft and gentle man hiding inside of a tough exterior. The way your pulse his lips hover inches from mine, and his fingers press against the tender beating in my neck, as he breathes goes fucking crazy when I touch you, especially here his free hand slides down over my stomach and into the front of my pajama pants. You're always so ready for me. He groans, running his middle finger up and down. I feel my skin catch fire it's a steady burn instead of an explosion, as fits his gentle touch. Hardin removes his hand, then brings his finger to his lips. So sweet he says, and his wet tongue slowly darts out to cover the tip of his finger. He knows exactly what he's doing to me. He knows how much his dirty words affect me and how much they make me want him. He knows, and he's doing a damn good job at making me burn with desire from the inside out. Chapter 98. Hardin. I know exactly what I'm doing to her. I know how much she loves my filthy mouth, and when I look down at her, she doesn't even bother to conceal it. You're being such a good girl I say with a dark smile, eliciting a moan from her without so much as a touch to her flaming skin. Tell me what you want I whisper into her ear. I can practically hear her erratic pulse under her skin. I'm driving her crazy, and I fucking love it. You, she says, desperately, vaguely. I want it slow. I want you to feel every single moment that you are away from me. I tug on her pajamas and give her a commanding look. Without a word she nods and pulls them down. Then I press my thumb into her thin cotton panties, tearing them from her body. Her eyes are white and dark, her lips pink and swollen. The force of my movement pulls her into me, and she wraps both of her small hands around my arms, hooking them with her beautiful little fingers. Grab the condom, she reminds me. Fuck, it's across the hall in the room that no one could have possibly expected me to actually stay in, with Tessa only meters away. Curiously, however, the nightstand was stocked with condoms upon my arrival. You grab the condom. I playfully fight back, knowing there's no chance in hell I'm having her scurry across the hallway half-dressed. I gently push my hands under her back and unsnap her bra, then slide the black straps down before tossing the whole contraption onto the floor behind us. Conned, she starts to remind me. But her own sharp intake of breath interrupts the thought as I suck on her newly exposed nipples. She's so sensitive to my touch, and I want to savor every second of her. SHHI silence her by biting down on the sensitive flesh. But after a moment, I do climb to my feet. I don't waste my time getting dressed. At least I'm wearing boxers, even if I wasn't, I sure as hell wouldn't be wasting my time putting clothes on right now. I return to the room, four condoms in hand I'm a little ambitious and overprepared, but with the way Tessa is behaving tonight, we may need the entire drawerful. I missed you, she sweetly remarks, a shy smile covering her face. And then there's a flash of embarrassment in her eyes, when she realizes she said the words aloud. 
and I you, I reply, which sounds as cheesy as I expected it to. Without any further hallmark statements, I move to join her on the bed again. She's sitting up, completely topless, with her back against the headboard and her knees slightly bent. She's completely naked, only the cream satin sheets drape over the top of her thighs, blending in with her creamy skin. I have to control myself at the sight. I have to stop myself from literally diving onto the bed, ripping the sheets away from her, and taking what is mine. I want a night well morning now, to go smoothly, and I don't want to rush it. Smiling, I stare at the woman on the bed. She's staring back at me, her eyes soft and warm, her cheeks painted a deep pink. When I join her on the bed, eager hands move straight to the lining of my boxers, tugging them down my thighs. Her feet finish the job, and she gathers me in her hand, squeezing gently. Christ, I hiss, momentarily losing my focus on everything except her touch. She begins to slowly pump, her small wrist twisting slightly as it moves up and down, and I fucking love the way she knows exactly how to touch me. As she lays herself down, her hand keeps a steady rhythm, and I give her the condom, silently instructing her what to do next. She bites her lip and quickly obliges. As the latex rolls down me, I silently curse at her, and myself, for never following through with the birth control plan. The feeling of skin on skin with her is heavenly, and now that I felt it, I crave more and more. She's quick to climb on top of me, and straddle my waist, my dick only a breath away from slipping inside her. Wait I stop her by gently wrapping my hands around her hips, and laying her back down beside me on the bed. Confusion flashes in her beautiful eyes. What's wrong? Nothing I just want to kiss you a little more first, I assure her, and cup my hand around the nape of her neck to bring her face closer to mine. My mouth covers hers, and I hover over her body, forcing myself to take this low. With her naked body pressed against mine, I take a moment to appreciate that after all the shit I've put her through, she's still here, she's always fucking here, and it's about goddamn time I make it worth her while. I support my weight with one arm and lie on top of her, parting her legs with my knee. I love you so much. You still know that, don't you? I ask her between strokes of my tongue over hers. She nods, but for a dreadful moment, Zed's face appears in my mind. His confession of love for my Tessa, and her thankful acceptance of it. I love you too, she had moaned in her sleep. A slow shiver travels through me, and I pause. Noticing my hesitation, she pushes her fingers into my unruly hair, and takes possession of my mouth with hers. Come back to me, she begs. That's all it takes. Everything fades except for the softness of her body underneath mine, the wetness between her legs as I slowly push into her. The feeling is exquisite. No matter how many times I've taken her, it won't ever be enough. I love you. She repeats the words. I wrap one arm under her, so our bodies are pressed as closely together as possible. I lick my dry lips and bury my head in her neck again, whispering dirty things into her ear and moving to kiss her every time she moans my name. I feel the buildup of pressure rising from my spine, igniting every fucking vertebra. Tessa's fingernails dig into my back, across my shoulder blades, as if she's reaching for the words inked across my skin. The words meant for her, and only her. I never wish to be parted from you from this day on it says. And I'm going to do everything I have to do in order to keep my permanent promise. I lean up to look at her. One hand still rests under her back, the other travels up her torso and across both of her breasts, and rests just below her throat. Tell me how it feels I say with a grunt. I'm barely holding on to the pleasure that is coursing though me. I want to keep it there for both of us, to make it last longer. I want to create this space that we can both inhabit. My movements quicken, and she moves one of her hands down to fist the bed sheets. Every sinful twist of my hips, every violin thrust into her waiting body, intensifies and further seals the power she has over me. So good, hard and so good her voice is thick and hoarse, and I swallow the rest of her moans like the greedy. Bastard I am. I feel her body begin to go rigid, and I can't wait any longer. With a soft cry of her name, I spill into the condom with slow and sloppy thrusts before collapsing, barely breathing, next to her. I reach over and pull her body to mine, 
and when I open my eyes, a sheer layer of sweat covers her silky skin, her eyes are open, and she's staring at the ceiling fan. You okay? I ask her. I know I was a little rough toward the end, but I also know how much she loves that shit. Yeah, of course. She leans over to plant a kiss on my bare chest and climbs out of the bed. I groan in disappointment when she pulls her white t-shirt down over her head, covering her body. Here's your headband. She smiles, proud of her corny remark, and she tosses the sweat-dampened t-shirt I wrapped around my head in the gym onto the bed. I roll the fabric up and wrap it around my head again, just to get a reaction out of her. You don't like it? I ask, and she giggles. I do, actually. Tessa is really putting on a show as she bends down to pick up her black panties from the floor and shimmies them up her thighs. That she isn't wearing a bra is wonderfully apparent as she shakes her body. Good. It's easier this way. I point to the contraption on my head. I really need a fucking haircut. But Steph's friend, a lavender-haired chick named Mads, has always been the one to cut it. My blood begins to boil at the thought of Steph. That stupid fucking earth to harden. Tessa's voice brings me out of my hateful thoughts. I snap my head up. Sorry. Back in her pajamas, Tessa snuggles up next to me and, strangely, grabs the remote to the TV and starts flipping around trying to find something to watch. I'm a little dazed. So the cooldown feels comfortable, but after a few minutes I realize she's sighed quite a few times. And when I look over at her, there's a deep scowl on her face, like finding a program to watch is more frustrating than it should be. Something wrong? I ask her. No, she lies. Tell me now, I press, and she lets out a quick breath. It's nothing I'm just a little her cheeks flush. Wound up. Wound up. You should be anything but wound up after that. I pull back a little and look at her. I didn't you know, I, I didn't, she stutters. Her shyness never fails to surprise me. One minute she's moaning into my ear to fuck her harder, faster, deeper, and the next she can't form a sentence. Spill it, I demand. I didn't finish. What? I choke. Had I really been that consumed by my own pleasure that I didn't notice when she didn't come? You stopped right before she quietly explains. Why didn't you say something? Come here, then. I tug at her shirt to lift it over her head. What are you going to do, she asks, excitement laced in her tone. SHH I don't know what I want to do I want to make love to her again, but I need a little more time to refuel. Wait, got it. We're going to do something that we've only done once. I smirk at her, and her eyes widen. Because, you know, practice makes perfect. What's that? And just like that, her excitement has been replaced by nervousness. I lie back on my elbows and beckon to her to come to me. I don't get it, she says. Come here. Put your thighs here. I tap the empty space on both sides of my head. What? Tessa, come here, and then spread your thighs over my face, so I can get you off right and proper, I explain slowly and clearly. Oh, she squeaks. I see the hesitation in her eyes and I reach over to turn the lamp off. I want her to be as comfortable as possible. Despite the darkness, I can still make out the soft planes of her body, the fullness of her chest, the sexy curve of her hips. Tessa removes her panties, and within seconds she's following my instructions and kneeling over me. This is quite the view I have here, I tease her, and my vision disappears. She's pulled my t-shirt down over my eyes. Well, this is much hotter, actually. I smile against her thighs. She smacks me playfully on the head in response. Really, though it's really fucking hot, I add. I hear her laugh in the darkness, and I bring my hands to her hips, guiding her movements. Once my tongue touches her, she begins to move her hips on her own, tugging at my hair and whispering my name until she loses herself in the pleasure I'm giving her. Chapter 99. Tessa. I come back to reality, slowly, unwillingly, but Happy Harden's lying next to me. Hey. He smiles, kissing me on my lips. I laugh, it's a lazy sound, not wanting to move. My body is slightly sore, but in the best way. I wish you weren't leaving tomorrow, I whisper while running my fingertips over one of the branches on his tattoo. The tree is dark, haunting and intricate. 
I wonder, if Hardin were getting this tattoo now, would he get the dead tree again? Or would there be just a few leaves on the branches, now that he's happier, more lively? Me too, he answers simply. I can't mask the desperation behind my plea, when I say then don't. Hardin's fingers spread across my back, and he presses my naked body closer to his. I don't want to, but I know you're only saying that, because I just made you come repeatedly. A horrified scoff falls from my lips. That's not true. Hardin's body shakes gently with an amused chuckle. It really isn't the only reason maybe we could be with each other on the weekends for a little while and see where it goes from there? Do you expect me to drive you every weekend? Not everyone. I'll come there too. I tilt my head to look into his eyes. It's working for us so far. Tessa he sighs, I already told you how I felt about the long distance shit. My eyes flicker to the ceiling fan slowly spinning around and around in the dimness of the room. Rachel is pouring marinara sauce into Monica's handbag on the television screen. Yes, yet here you are, I challenge him. He sighs and tugs gently at the ends of my hair, forcing me to look at him once more. Touché. Well, I think there's some sort of compromise that can be reached here, don't you? What's your offer, he asks softly, briefly closing his eyes to take a deep breath. I don't know exactly give me a moment, I say. What exactly am I offering him? It's in the best interest of both of our sanities to stay somewhat distant from each other for now. As much as my heart forgets all the terrible things that Hardin and I have been through in the past, my brain won't allow me to give up all of my remaining dignity. I am in Seattle, following my dream, alone, with no apartment, because of Hardin's possessive nature and the unwillingness of both of us to compromise over even the most trivial details. I don't know, really, I finally say when I can't come up with a solid suggestion. Well, do you want me around still? Just for the weekends, at least, he asks. His fingers twist and twirl my hair. Yes. Every weekend? Mostly. I smile. Do you want to talk on the phone each day like we did this week? Yes. I love the simple way Hardin and I spoke on the phone, neither of us even noticing the minutes and hours as they ticked by. So everything will be the same as it was this week, then. I don't know about that, he says. Why not? It seemed to work for him so far, so why would he object to continuing the same way? Because, Tessa, you're here in Seattle without me, and we aren't actually together, you could see someone else or meet someone, Hardin. I lift myself onto my elbow to look down at him. His eyes bore into mine, and a lock of my unruly blonde hair falls onto his face. Without breaking eye contact or even so much as a blink, his fingers move to tuck the fallen hair back behind my ear. I'm not planning on seeing or meeting anyone else. All I want out of this is some independence and for both of us to be able to communicate. Why is it so important to you to be independent all of a sudden? He asks. His thumb and forefinger glide across the shell of my ear, sending a shiver down my spine. If he's trying to distract me, he's succeeding. Despite his gentle touch and burning jade eyes, I continue in my quest to make him understand where I'm coming from. It's not a sudden thing. I've mentioned this to you before. I also hadn't noticed just how dependent on you I was until recently, and I don't like it. I don't like being that way. I do, he says quietly. I knew you do, but I don't, I say, refusing to allow the confidence in my voice to falter. A part of me pats myself on the back, then rolls her eyes at me, because she isn't buying it. Well, how do I play into this independent shit? Just keep doing what you're doing now. I have to be able to make decisions without thinking about having your permission, or what you would think about them. You definitely don't think about having my permission now or you wouldn't do half the shit you do. I don't want to have a fight. Hardin, I warn him. This is important to me. I need to be able to think for myself. We should be partners equals, neither of us should hold more power than the other. I struggle to find the words, sifting through my mind for a better way to explain what I want what I need. I have to do this. This is part of who I am, or who I want to be. I'm working hard to find myself, to find out who I am on my own, with or without Hardin. Equals? Power? Do you obviously have more power here? I mean, come on. 
it's not only for me, it's been good for you too. You know it has. I guess so, but what does that say about us, that we can only get along, if we're in different cities?" He asks putting into words the question that's been nagging at me since he arrived. Well, we'll figure that out later. Sure. He stubbornly rolls his eyes, but softens the reaction by kissing my forehead. Remember what you said about there being a difference between loving someone and not being able to live without them? I ask. I don't ever want to hear that statement again, really. I swipe his damp hair off of his forehead. You're the one who said it, I remind him. My fingertips graze along the outline of his nose, down to his swollen lips. I've been thinking about it, so much since then, I admit. Harding groans in annoyance. Why? Because you said it for a reason, didn't you? Out of anger, that's all. I didn't have a clue what it even meant. I was just being a dick. Well, either way, I keep thinking about it. I gently tap on the tip of his nose. Well, I wish you wouldn't, because there's no difference between the two. His words fall slowly between us, his tone thoughtful. How so? He gives me a small smile. I can't live without you, and I love you, they go hand in hand. If I could live without you, I wouldn't be as in love with you as I am, and I clearly cannot be far from you. I'll say. I bite back the giggle that's threatening to emerge. He notices my lightness. I know you aren't talking about me, you nearly busted your ass running to tackle me when I arrived. Even in the darkness of the room, I can see his bright, widening smile, and my breath catches as I take in the raw beauty of him. When he behaves this way, unguarded and natural, there's nothing better in my world. I knew you were going to torture me for that. I swat at his bare chest, and his hand flies up to catch my wrist between his long fingers. Are you trying to get rough with me again? Look what happened last time. He lifts his head off the mattress, and the heat begins to spread down my body, resting between my already sore thighs. Can you stay one more day? I dodge his remark about being rough. I need to know if I'm going to have more time with him tomorrow, so we can spend the remainder of the morning hours while getting rough. Please, I add, snuggling my head into the crook of his neck. Fine, he says. I can feel his jaw move as he smiles against my forehead. But only if you blindfold me again. In one quick motion, he wraps his arms around my back and flips my body under his, and seconds later we're lost in each other again and again chapter 100. Harden. Kimberly is sitting at the breakfast bar when I walk into the kitchen. Her face is free of makeup, and her hair is pulled back away from her face. I don't think I've ever seen her without a shit ton of crap on her face, and for Vance's sake I contemplate hiding the shit from her, because she looks much better without it. Well, look who's finally awake, she says in a chipper tone. Yeah, yeah. I groan and walk straight past her to the coffee machine nestled in the corner of the dark granite countertop. What time are you leaving, she asks while picking at a bowl of lettuce. Not until tomorrow, if that's okay. Or do you want me out now? I fill a mug with the black liquid and turn to face her. Of course you can stay. She grins. As long as you aren't being an asshole to Tessa. Actually, I'm not. I roll my eyes as Vance enters the room. You need to get a tighter leash on this one, perhaps even a muzzle, I tell him. A deep bellowing laugh comes from her fiancé just as Kimberly raises her middle finger to me. So classy, I taunt her. You're in an awfully cheery mood. Christian grins wickedly, and Kimberly shoots him a glare. What the hell is that about? Wonder why that is, he adds, and she elbows him. Christian she scolds, and he shakes his head. His hand lifts in defense to block her from repeating the playful assault. Probably because he's Miss Tessa, Kimberly suggests and eyes Christian as he circles around the oversized island to grab a banana from the fruit basket. His eyes twinkle in amusement as he pulls down the peel of a banana. I heard midnight workouts will do that. My blood turns cold. What did you say? Calm down he shut the camera off before the good stuff, Kimberly assures me. Camera? Fuck. A fucking course this asshole would have a camera in his gym hell. Every main access room is probably equipped with security cameras. He's always been more paranoid behind that slick demeanor than he lets on. What did you see? I growl, 
trying to keep my pulsing anger. Obey. Nothing. Only that Tessa came into the room, he knew better than to continue Kimberly bites back a grin, and relief floods through me. I was too caught up in the moment, caught up in Tessa, to think about shit like security cams. I scowl at Vance. Why were you even watching the footage? That's pretty fucking creepy that you were watching me work at. Don't flatter yourself. I was checking the kitchen monitor, because it had a short, the gym just happened to be playing alongside it at the time. Sure I say, stretching the word out. Harden staying another night, that's fine, right? Kim asks him. Of course it's fine. I don't know why your ass isn't here to stay anyway. You know I'll pay you more than Bolthouse. You didn't the first time, that was the problem, I remind him with a smug grin. That's because you were only a freshman in college at the time. You were lucky to have a paid internship, let alone an actual job, without a degree. He shrugs, trying to dismiss my argument. I cross my arms in defense. Bolthouse disagrees with you. They are twats. Need I remind you that in the last year alone, Vance Publishing has surpassed them by a huge margin. I've expanded here to Seattle, and I plan on opening a New York office by next year. Is there a point to all this bragging? I ask. Yes. Point is, Vance is better, bigger, and happens to be where she's working. He doesn't have to say Tessa's name for me to feel the weight of his words. You'll be graduating after the semester, don't make an impulsive decision now that will impact the entirety of your career before it even begins. He takes a quick bite of the fruit in his hand, and I scowl at him, trying to think of a sharp reply. I can't seem to come up with one. Bolthouse has an office in London. He looks at me in mocking disbelief. Who's going back to London? You? He doesn't hide the sarcasm in his voice. Possibly. I had planned on it and still am. Yeah, so did I. He glances at his future wife. You'll never go back to live there, just as I won't either. Kimberly flushes and gushes at his words, and I come to the conclusion that they're the most obnoxious couple I've ever encountered. It's like you can see how much they love each other just by watching them interact. It's annoying and uncomfortable. Point proven. Christian snickers. I didn't agree with you, I snap. Yes, Kimberly Butson, like the ballbuster she is. But you didn't disagree either. Without another word, I take my coffee mug and my balls as far away from Kimberly as I can get them. Chapter 101. Tessa. The morning arrives much too quickly, and when I wake up, I'm alone in the bed. The empty side of the mattress still bears the imprint of Hardin's body, so he must have gotten up only a few minutes ago. Right on cue, he enters the room quietly, coffee mug in hand. Good morning, he says when he notices that I'm awake. Morning. My throat is tight and dry. Images of Hardin moving in and out of my mouth with furious thrusts makes my insides tighten. Are you feeling okay? He places the steaming mug of coffee on the dresser and walks over to the bed. He sits down next to me on the edge of the mattress. Answer me, he calmly adds when I take too long to respond. Yeah, just sore. I stretch my arms and legs out in front of. Me. Yes definitely sore. Where did you go? I went to get some coffee, and I had to call Landon to tell him I won't be home today, he tells me. If you still want me to stay, that is. I do. I nodded him. But why do you have to tell Landon? Hardin runs his hand over his hair, and his eyes concentrate on reading my expression. I get the feeling that I'm missing something here. Answer me, I say, using his own words back at him. He's babysitting your dad. Why? Why would my father need a babysitter? Your dad's trying to get sober, that's why. And I'm not stupid enough to leave him at that apartment by himself. Do you have liquor there, don't you? No, I tossed it. Just drop this, okay? His tone is no longer gentle. It's urgent, and he's clearly on edge. I'm not going to just drop it. Is there something that I should know? Because I feel like I'm being left out of the loop here, again. I cross my arms over my chest, and he takes a deep, dramatic breath his eyes closing with a gesture. Yes, there is something that you don't know about, but I'm begging you to just trust me, okay? How bad? I ask. 
The possibilities terrify me. Just trust me, okay? Trust you to do what? Trust that I will take care of all of this shit, so that by the time I tell you what happened, it won't matter anymore. You have enough shit going on right now. Please, just trust me on this. Let me do this for you, and let it go, he urges. The initial paranoia and panic that always come with these types of situations flutter through me, and I'm moments away from snatching Hardin's phone from him and calling Landon myself. The look on Hardin's face, though, stops me. He's pleading for me to trust him on this, trust that he'll be able to fix whatever it is that's going on. And to tell the truth, as much as I want to know, I don't think I can handle another problem on my already full plate. Okay. I sigh. His brows furrow, and he cocks his head to the side. Really? He's astounded by how easy it was to persuade me to back off, I'm sure. Yes. I'll do my best not to worry about the situation with my dad, as long as you can promise me that it's better for me not to know. He nods. I promise. I believe him, mostly. Fine. I finalize the agreement with a word and try my best to push my obsessive need to know what's happening to the back of my mind. I need to trust Hardin with this. I need to trust him of my own resolve. If I can't trust him with this, how can I entertain a future for us at all? I sigh, and Hardin smiles at my acquiescence. 